Welcome to the very first unregistered live show. Thank you so much for coming out. This is a historic speakeasy, former speakeasy. I thought it was fairly appropriate for those of you who know my work. And I am so excited to have two of the greatest guests I could have in New York City, the great Nick Gillespie. Thank you. And the awesome Dave Smith. They told me before that they're all talked out, they don't have much to say, so it's basically just gonna be me talking to you guys, because these are not, they're sort of shy, they don't tend to talk much in public, and uh, they're nervous, so I, I wanted to go easy on them. So no questions for them, I'm just gonna you know, wait for them to contribute. Uh, but uh, I wanted to start uh, by talking about something that is something that Dave doesn't like to talk about, which is a non-political thing. He's a very political animal, you know, but he's been talking a lot about his change of mind lately about certain things, and nice Jewish boy from Brooklyn raised in a liberal family in, uh, what was it, near Park Slope? In Park Slope, right? Park Slope, yeah. Park Slope, yeah. Um, which, All uh, right, Park Slope in the house. Yeah. Watch your fucking wallets. <laughs> <We got> some... <laughs> Park Slope. I, I'm, a, I'm a former sloper here. Uh, got a, yeah, I know all about it. So Dave, um, Dave, you've gone through some changes, apparently. You, you've had a, a child recently. I have indeed. Uh, this is a non-political topic, although maybe it is political. You're gonna make it political in a second, aren't you? Now, you, because of this child thing. I feel like you're about to uh, like um, talk show host me and go, and she's here. Yeah. And you're like, whoa, <laughs> what? It's past your bedtime. So you have a daughter. I do. And how old is she? She is seven months and one week. Seven months and one week. Now, I've heard this has had quite an effect on you and the way you've been thinking about things, including about politics. You want to talk about that for a second? Uh, sure. Well, that's a broad... Uh, th I mean, okay, so kid... are you, talk about Jeffrey Epstein, then. <laughs> it's, it's made me understand where he's coming from. Yeah. Uh, they're just... Everyone's into their own thing. Yeah. Um, as long as nobody's being harmed. Yeah, right? well, that's right. Yeah. No, everyone's voluntary. No, Jesus Christ. I'm going to say, <laughs> I've, these drinks have gone to my head. I'm going to say something wrong. No, but it has. I mean, I don't know. Doesn't having a kid, everyone who has a kid would say, it changes your uh, mindset on everything. Mm -hmm. And it, it, I'd say the main thing it, may, it made me realize was that there's something about the way we live today, like in our, in 2019 America, where I think that, most, I think historically, usually there were like forces that we don't really deal with today, like um, uh, chivalry, religion, uh, loyalty, these expectations of like these kind of bigger things that you're supposed to live for. And someone like me, who's a 90s kid who grew up in Park Slope, who, it was all kind of like about yourself and your big thing was like, I don't know, let me finish my homework so I can play video games. I want to have fun. That's kind of the, the stuff we grow up with. Like, what's really important is that you're happy. And there's never like this central purpose. I didn't grow up with like God, country, religion, you know, any of this stuff. But once you have a kid, your life gets a little bit more centered where you're like, well, I, I actually got to figure have a out purpose. ways not to come home. That's like, right. How do I stay out of the house? I have longer. to avoid yeah. rocking a baby every so wait, single wait, wait, night. Wait, wait, wait. So, how does, uh, how does, how did this change your life then? I mean, uh, be specific because right now you're just kind of. Who's the host here? Yeah. yeah, what are you? Sorry, yeah. It's, oh, it's, it's fine. So no, it's, a, the child, it's a free but, for all. It's okay. okay. It's fine. Yeah. I wasn't prepared to get grilled by Reason Magazine tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'm you know, ranting you, with Thaddeus You should be Russell. outsourcing. You should be outsourcing <laughs> that parenting, you know, to well, somebody it, who's competent. Listen, <laughs> I, I have hired the best Chinese babysitter m yeah. that you don't even know twenty cents the same a month. Person can buy. It's so racist. Yeah. Is she the supposed to be West Indian? Everybody. What are you doing yeah. with a Chinese babysitter when there's West Indians all over the place who are willing to take that job? They come cheaper. Ah. I'm a pure capitalist. W well done. Uh, but it does it it changes your mentality about everything. It's not I always looked at it kind of like, oh, I want to have this career because that's what I, I want to do with my life. And I want to, you know, everything now is like, well, I, I need to do this so that she's okay like that's my whole purpose is just that she's taken care of and then whatever 
after that, if I make you assholes laugh, who really cares? You know, like that's. Now, you've also made some waves, as I understand it. And have you changed your position on abortion? Is yes. this the thing? Okay. And is oh, this... man, we're starting with right, this. I hope this. I, I yes, really I hope, have. and I know the answer to this, but I hope you're going to tell people that now you're in favor of it. <laughs> he advocates having it. a kid, yeah. Mandated. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Okay. Good idea. No, come on. So well, we'd have fewer assholes. <laughs> yeah, we'd also have fewer. People. Everything. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. Well, you like Chinese people, so I thought that's what you were following on. You know, the, the Chinese attitude toward childbirth is not yours. But anyway, so tell yeah. me, so, so when, was this because of having a, a kid and you changed your mind on abortion because of this? Yeah, I think it, uh, it happened over the course of my wife being pregnant and having the baby that I, I was leaning in, in the pro-life direction and then I fell into it. You were after. leaning. Yes. Is this because you hang out with these uh, libertarians who are Catholics? Yeah, that might be part of it. The Ron Pauls, the Lou Rockwells, the, the Mises well, Ron Caucus. Paul, I don't really way, hang out with Christian. Ron Paul. Yes, you like, do. I'm not like getting yes, hammered. You do. But Ron, Ron Paul is a Baptist, and if he's still practicing as a Baptist, he understands that the Catholic Church is the world's largest cult, and it's the horror of Revelation 17. <laughs> Ooh. So, but I think I read anti, that in End of Fed. anti abortion. Yeah. <laughs> that was in the in the Ron Paul survival report. You know, the, the Pope, the oh. Pope is the horror we've, of Babylon. Okay, so yeah. okay, so we've begun with abortion right away, and then like Ron Paul's racist past. Wait, uh, but why? So why are you against abortion? Though? Are you saying that from the moment of conception, or or like why? Why did your personal experience? Of having of your wife having a baby change your mind on that well okay so I would say that um, and by the way Nick thanks for having me on your podcast yeah um, I, I that's why Nick's here because I, I get would, tired uh, I would say that it was there, there's a couple elements right so number one when your wife is pregnant if anyone here uh, has had a baby or had uh, been married to someone who's had a baby right when when your wife is pregnant yeah but nick you had a baby in like 1971 i'm no, talking about true, people yeah. that was post, back, yeah. post sonogram <laughs> technology <laughs> if you've had a yeah. Look, when you go in for bi-monthly sonograms, you learn a lot more about the development of a fetus. So there's that, which is just the scientific part of it, is that you learn science. how... Well, you know, okay, science, that social You know what I feel about science, science that, uh, Dave. That's, we covered this last night. You that's know, right. Science is problematic, but, but keep, so keep, there's, keep going. So there's that. You, I, I learned a lot more about the development of a fetus. Um, at, there's also the, the emotional part of it, I'm sure, which is that you, know, you get very connected uh, to this baby. And what I realized was, as I went through the process, um, look, there's really no... The, the abortion, the difficulty in abortion becomes like, when do you think, to me... It goes, when do you think it's an act of aggression to kill a fetus? When does a fetus become a baby? And the more I went through the process, it's like, well, okay. The idea, my body, my choice, and all that stuff, uh, kind of, y you realize how weak that is. I mean, really, uh, uh, my, okay, so my wife was, uh, she was a week over her due date. So they induced her, because that's what they do now. Uh, they, they induce you. They, they don't let you go more than a week over because they think that's healthier. Then Now, if it was 20 years ago, they would have let her go over. Maybe it would have been two weeks, three weeks over. Who knows? Um, but they decided this is the day. So did they decide that that's the day? The ba now, I know you, you pushed me toward the other difficult end, which is when does conception start? But I'm asking you, when is it a baby? You know, like that's, yeah. and, you, and passing through the birth canal isn't some magical process. That was my baby one day earlier just inside my wife. So would it be okay to kill the baby then? Is it okay to kill it the next so, day yeah, because but, it but came nobody, out? But nobody, nobody's there, actually, that's not where the argument is. The argument oh, is. I don't know if you've been paying attention in Virginia. Yeah, that is exactly no, no. where the, the argument, argument is. The, that is, the, in wait, fact, wait, wait, it's no. a day later no, is where the is argument not. is. The argument in, in Virginia is, do you have to perform in blackface in order to be a <laughs> Or if you are an African American, can you be a rapist? Is that a, a job requirement? All right, requirement? Nick, that's Hold very on, offensive. No, There's no, a 50-50 chance he was the Klansman yeah. okay. in that uh, <laughs> picture. So, but but the, the real argument about abortion in America has to do with the first three months, because like 90% plus of abortions get, get are done before eight or nine weeks. So we're, what yeah, we're talking about is a much a, a much more uh, kind of 
um, less developed fetus. Okay, and but I so was... is I mean the the question is like you're you're making an argument then because you don't know when it's a child. You say it's a child from the no. moment of conception. Hold on. So you started by saying the first day, then I went to the last day. Right. We're both using extremes to paint a picture. No, but I'm not. The argue... because I, I don't think well, the, I the, actually... you are because the, no. the majority of abortions are. Can you on the guys first both day. shut the fuck up for a second? So I have a question. That's fair enough. I have a question. No, I have a statement. I have a statement. Um, uh, I I am sympathetic to Dave's argument, and I am sympathetic sympathetic. I'm not on the side of the pro-life, so-called pro-life. Thaddeus argument. Russell, Christian conservative, everybody. I've converted one more. Where's the holy uh, water? Yeah. <laughs> Did I do that right? I don't know. Uh, uh, we can't we can't prove or disprove that it's murder, can we? It just it's just not something that you can prove. Well, could you prove or anything? disprove it's a murder? Well, so well, some when it, people actually say because that, babies don't talk. I mean, sorry, fetuses don't talk, right? We can't ever know what they experience. That was going to be the next look who's talking or boss babe. It was going to be a fetus talking, but oh, yeah? that never yeah, 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 yeah. that one never they couldn't get the script to, to yeah. work right. But. Yeah. So, you know, what's the evidence that it's murder, but then again, what's the evidence that it's not murder? So then you so. would you would tip to the side of saying, well, if it might be murder, the prudent thing is to just ban ban it, right? Well, no, I, right. I just want to live in a state that, you know, allows it. Yeah. And so, but the people in Missouri, the good people of Mississippi have decided that it's murder. And I'm, I respect that. I just don't want to live there. I also think they're going to lose a lot of their female population because of it. Now, is that Mississippi or am I confusing it with Alabama? Is it the eight week? Yeah, it's rule? also Ohio. Because that's not actually Ohio saying it's murder. And, Georgia. And, and Texas, right? Well, uh, uh, Texas, I think, might have tried and Virginia tried, but I don't think they ended up. So the word murder is in some legislature yeah. there? Some well, legislation? It's also, so just, it's but hold on, let me just say it's in not response. a heart yet because that's, these are fetal heartbeat laws. Mm -hmm. Right, and they, the organ is not fully formed then. So right. that I mean, part of no, the problem not, here it's, is you can the hear language. the heartbeat. No, but yeah, but it's not a heart. It's it's a pulse. You know, I, it's an organelle. It's not an organ. And this is where yeah, but, the confusion, because we're talking about fetuses or unborn children, et cetera. Like, we're already in a slippery postmodern maze of language, where the language kind of creates the outcome that you seek. Oh, okay. You, when you say that there's, you're talking about the first day after conception, and that that's not using an extreme to paint a point the way I was with the last day. No. The the controversial bill that we're all talking mm -hmm. about is two months. It's not the first day. No. Nobody's even arguing. Even these extreme right wingers, who everyone's like, For, "Oh my God, there's a war on women's rights." By the way, the only individual no. right that the left seems to care about is to kill your baby. A little bit weird. I'm gonna have to just um, raise but, my hand from now on. Uh, so for the ignoramuses who don't read the news like me, can you please explain what this bill is? Well, I know the one, I, I believe it's in Alabama where it's an eight week ban. After eight weeks, uh, you can't have an abortion. And I think they called it the heartbeat uh, act or, or something like that. fetal heartbeat laws. Some, that right. So it's a fetal heartbeat is detected, then you can no longer legally. So, I mean, I, I don't know. It's Look, I mean, that to me seems pretty arbitrary. I actually think that any point other than uh, conception is a completely arbitrary time to say this is now a unique human being that has some degree of rights. I mean, the right to not be murdered. Uh, you know, I, and by the way, I would. This is all I'd say, right? Because we probably we're not going to solve this. I'm not going to convince these two oh. postmodernists. Oh, yes, we are to yeah, believe yeah, with yeah, my yeah. moral uh, agree with my moral belief. But I will say this: How about that? go look into YouTube, Google the actual process. That is abortion because nobody ever I, and from the, all of the pro-choice people I've talked to, very few of them ever seem to have any knowledge of what the actual process of abortion is. Go look into it. It is way more horrifying than you would think it is. Fair enough. And so that, I, that's yeah. I would just this say is, that. And that's this is true what, of any medical procedure, unless you're a serial killer. Of course, it's it, yes. it's disturbing. That that's a terrible way to say I have a feeling of disgust or revulsion at some kind of physical process so it should be banned. No, I'm making the Thaddeus Russell the antithesis argument. of I think of no. the libertarian rationality. Whoa. That's positive. No, the libertarian rationality is really the non-aggression principle. And I'm asking you to think about whether this is an act of aggression or not. As Thaddeus made the argument last night, if you're going to debate the postmodernists, you should probably read the postmodernist literature. Mm -hmm. Let not do what I do and just watch Jordan Peterson videos, right? So, which... 
as I said last night at the debate, I don't understand postmodernism at all, but my room is spotless. <laughs> so I feel like I'm making progress. Um, but I'm just saying, if you're going to debate the issue of abortion, you should know what the procedure this looks like. That was all I was saying. I'm not saying, I'm just saying. Have you ever been involved in an abortion? I am an abortion. <laughs> have you seen? I don't have no, you, I have no, been. I and what I, do you mean involved? Uh, have you ever been party to an abortion? What do you mean party to? Uh, involved with a person who got pregnant. Yes. And you decided to. Yes. You know, terminate. But I wasn't pregnancy. there for the procedure. No, no. But, yeah, I'm okay, not saying okay. that. But because for a second, it sounded like you were just hanging out while people oh, were yeah, doing well, abortions. Yeah, we just like, we just both yeah, admitted yeah. something really personal and private. That's it pretty is. good. Well, and unregistered. That's in 16 minutes. We did that. That's but, good. But I think it's important. And this was one of the um, you know also putting this in a historical context. Um, you know when abortions were outlawed. You know there's a, a regardless of the morality of something, the policy did not work well to protect women. Um, or, or babies because people just got illegal abortions mm -hmm. that were much less safe, et cetera. I was gonna, just gonna say that a big part of that movement was women coming forward to say, look, I have had an abortion and I'm not a monster yeah. or anything like that. And I think men should be willing to also cop to the fact that you know I've participated in this some right My and, and not just and I'm uh, oddly I'm like not a Republican congressman you know and, and yet I'm willing to admit this. my mother went to Mexico to get an abortion in the 1960s yeah. but he survived everybody. exactly I knew that was coming so, here we go. <laughs> I, I, I just set him up here's the stand-up comic here's your I'll be your straight man it's fine <laughs> Dave your argument reminds me of what vegetarians say about meat well go to the go to the killing floors you know in the cattle fields, right, and then see what happens in the in the slaughterhouses. I don't think that's a terrible argument. I don't either for, for a vegetarian. It's, it's, it's I mean, I don't know, data, but it's not. It it's not a terrible positive. argument. I wasn't saying this is a proof of yeah. my argument. Mm -hmm. I'm saying maybe we should. You should know what you're talking about and know. So I don't think that's a terrible argument for a fucking vegetarian yeah. to make. But I'm just making the point that look, if you're gonna say when abortion was uh, illegal, it didn't do anything to protect women or babies, well. I mean, how many abortions a year were there before it, Roe v. Wade there, there compared are, to how it, many there are after? Uh, so if you look at no, abortion you know what, as actually, killing I mean, a baby, do you, well, do you want to do you want to know? Because depending asking, on yeah. the estimates, it's everything from in the first couple of years after Roe versus Wade or after abortion was legalized, there were about a million abortions a year. Some of the estimates before that was close to that number. So there were a lot. There were almost the same number of abortions. There were certainly, almost certainly, more illegal abortions in the late '60s than there are legal abortions now because of better birth control and all sorts of other things. The actual number and incidence of unwanted pregnancies have been declining. So in a way, this issue is kind of being solved by technology and social changes, uh, which is good. And well, I think everybody wins in that sense. But, but it, when you so, say solved, when you say solved by technology and social so changes, we, we you're, don't need you're to be talking about abortion anymore. Okay, so first off, I, I, the numbers that I've looked at are yeah. nothing like that. Okay. That there was a million a year abortions before Roe v. Wade. Again, and it's please hard look to it know. up. No, but I, I mean, that's I've never seen even estimates that come I would close look at to that. Marvin Olasky, social, who is a conservative Christian writer, a journalism professor at UT uh, Austin, and uh, he wrote a book, a, a cultural history well, of abortion in America. So and, maybe, and maybe I'm wrong about that. I know about so one. Maybe, I know about one. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. The one that didn't take. But there's one. Uh, <laughs> But I'm just saying, okay, fine. But if you're saying there's something interesting, that there's an admission in there to saying that technology will solve this this issue, and by solve it you mean there'll be less abortions. Well, what if there's I mean nothing is that wrong there will with be no need for abortion. Right. So there'll so. be less of them. So I'm just saying, why is it even solving something? If if there's no moral no, issue, yeah. do you do you th if you think what that I'm there's no we issue with it, then why about solve it? it? We won't be talking about it. And also, by the way. Uh, you know, are you going to then ban, uh, because if you become anti-abortion, then you're also signing on to saying, okay, well, we're going to get rid of certain types of uh, uh, birth control, certain types of contraceptives, and abortion pills. The genie is out of the bottle in terms of individuals have more control over what they're doing in their lives. It's harder and harder for the police to show up and say, don't do this, don't do that. So you are, if you are, if you are signing on to a strict anti-abortion program, you're, you are signing on to building up the state and giving the state the right in the name of protecting mm. unborn children mm. or nearly born children to come in and kick doors down and put people in cages and all, yes. all of the raps that you want to do about stuff. Okay, so you're right. So so it's uh, so uh, obviously no, I'm just saying it, it gets complicated. Well, if we're talking about the political issue of building up the state, we all know the people who preach for abortion rights are always real small government liber libertarians, <laughs> right? They're the, hey, the, the least statist amongst the us, right? Movement. It's it's always the good AOCs no, the, in, of the world who are for for some reason. Think about that. By
by the way, isn't it strange that the the biggest status amongst us, the only time they will use a uh, libertarian rhetoric is when they're talking about a woman killing the baby inside of her. Oh, you, oh, so you, you you'll baby. actually now hear you'll actually hear a Democrat, a Democrat say the government should get out of health care decisions. <laughs> you know, is that uh, not an amazing moment is, in it's, time? It's good, and we can <laughs> when, work with this. When, we can work with this. And by the way, abortion did not become a democratic issue until years after Roe versus Wade, um, partly because. You know, abortion, the people who are anti abortion, it's a religious argument fundamentally. It's a theological argument that they're making. It's not a medical one, and it's not a legal well, one is, because the concept of personhood, the, you know, there's the So then is being anti murder a religious argument? No, no, no. Uh, what I'm saying is that there is a biological development of, of the fetus from, you know, a, 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 an ovum, you know, a fertilized egg into, into potentially a human being, right? Uh, there, there's a biological development. The, the thing that governs this is personhood. And at what point does the fetus uh, gain the rights, all or some of the rights of a fetus, uh, of a person? And that's the argument that we're going to have. The arguments so against abortion, well, I'll get to that in a second, but the arguments against abortion always come ultimately from a theological point of view. And it's, that's why they talk about the moment of conception, because they believe in souls and things like that which I don't believe in. I think, and this is uh, something I, I, I'm curious what people here think, there is not a clear moral distinction to say, okay, yes, never have abortions, or yes, always have abortions. We have kind of hashed out a social convention where we say, for, you know, basically through the first three months of pregnancy, the woman has nearly total control over her body, mm -hmm. and she can get rid of, a, she can end a pregnancy, and that's it. And Americans are kind of good with that. It tracks with earlier uh, kind of folk traditions about ensoulment or about the quickening of the fetus, mm -hmm. a certain level of development. And what we have said is that everybody recognizes this has the potential to become a human being, um, but up to a certain point, and that line is gonna change based on technology, on viability, all of this kind of stuff, we're gonna draw that line and it's gonna be kind of shifting. But I want you way. to answer Dave's question. Okay, which, which was? was? When is it murder according to you? Yeah, I, I think it. Uh, I think the point of viability, uh, when the when the fetus or the the child, uh, because it stops being a fetus, I guess in my uh, formulation, and when it can exist outside of the mother. So when there's a, a level of viability, and that line will be walked back because it's already you know uh, fetuses can survive outside the womb now, you know, much earlier than they could 20 or 30 or 40 so years the, ago. So the law, which is the law of the land where we are sitting right now, which is that you can get an abortion for the first two trimesters, no questions asked for anything yep. you want. Mm -hmm. Abortion is murder in your mind. Uh, because you depends. absolutely uh, are no, viable, no. at least potentially at viable, at the, point, uh, at the end of, not, not at the end of the first uh, but trimester. It, no, it's but it's second trimester. Trimester. the second trimester. Yeah, second trimester. Yeah. No, the law, but I'm yeah. saying the law of the land right now, so abortion yeah. is murder. Excellent. Excellent point. Dave. So Some you're part, not that yeah, far no, off from me. I mean, I agree. I don't think. But you're, are you are you saying that there shouldn't be uh, any abortion? I mean, are you saying it should be banned? It's one thing to say I'm yes. against it or I wouldn't participate in it, but if because then well, you Nick, are a, wait, wait, you're wait. a status. Do you not think that murder should be banned? <laughs> yeah, I yeah, mean, I come mean, on, come I'm, on. I'm gonna be. I'm really gonna go out there on a limb and say, you know what? I am a libertarian, and, but I am against murder. And I so think it is a crime. Yeah, but that's and, right. So you're calling me yeah. a status. I guarantee, Nick. And by the way, every, uh, everyone knows I love Nick Gillespie. Yeah, I no, fucking no, love no, this no, guy. No, okay, no, but the I idea that you're calling me a status, you support way more statism than I support. The one area. I won't Should support I is murdering now? babies. I mean, but come on, man. The, the one area that I'm saying the state should be involved with is don't murder a fucking baby. And I got Nick calling me a statist <laughs> for that. And I'm when an they anarcho capitalist. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm an anarchist. You're not a libertarian. You're an, ar an anarcho capitalist. That's, That's the uh, most libertarian position. No, I think, it's some, I think it's actually different than libertarianism. So I define think, libertarian. Oh, let's I, do I that. Think, let's I do think that. libertarianism. Let's move on to something more liber fun. Libertarianism. <laughs> now, this is we got, fun. we gotten more laughs out of yeah. an abortion conversation <laughs> than most people could hope to get. I will say that. Give it up. Very rare. Give it up. You get an abortion uh, debate with a I few punchlines in think the middle. That, I think that libertarianism or, or uh, libertarian view of government is simply, uh, you know, limited government, uh, strictly or more limited government than we have now. But government is not allowed to do everything. It's not allowed to, you know, to vote. You can't vote away your rights. But it's not anarchism. I, I you know, it's it's a really kind of 
white bread centrist position, which is that uh, for the most part, the default setting should always be that people are free to make whatever choices they want in their lives, but there are moments where we need a political consensus. Um, I don't have a problem with certain types of infrastructure, taxation. I don't think all taxation is theft, et cetera. I'm not an anarcho-capitalist, and, and I'm also, I'm only going to live to be 200 <laughs> because of great innovations and in technology and stuff like that. And given that, I don't have time to be like, oh, well, you know what I really want to do? It's like, we got to get these fucking sidewalks privatized, man. <laughs> you know, like, I can't even go outside without having to be, you know, walking on the man's streets or something. Like, I want to I wanna get on with my life. I also don't want to have conversations about abortion anymore because it's kind of like if you want an abortion, you can get one and it's safe and it's and it's it's effective and if you don't want to and if you want to preach to people and say don't get abortions you can do that and you might change their minds i mean i, I okay i don't we just know had what a any of that means. baby in the corner uh, there <laughs> clapping his flipper i just I, I mean if you're saying if you're saying but what you're you're an anarcho capitalist that's all it's different than being a libertarian is just a limited government a 19th century classical liberal so it, government should be limited to what i yeah, mean you're saying they, it's they an, should it's rose an ongoing argument it's an ongoing argument right and, and i'm saying they should be limited to nothing yeah so i'm the most libertarian no. position you can yeah, have that's, that's anarchism <laughs> it's not libertarianism because you don't believe in government so, is it I mean, not, I believe is it, it exists. Is it not the know. purest form of libertarianism, though? The, I don't the most I, radical I, I, no, form I, of it? I, I, no, it seems to be, but I think libertarianism oh. exists in a kind of spectrum here. Mm -hmm. Anarchism is something different, and anarchism can be right-wing or left-wing. Mm -hmm. I, I don't understand left-wing anarchism at all. Mm -hmm. You know, the idea that we, because it's, we want to get rid of the state, because it's but the state will do everything. Right, because it's communism. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah essentially. <laughs> yeah. But I do think that anarchism is, you know, and I, you know, we'll be arm-in-arm -arm in the barricade. Uh, right up until we have to fight about abortion. <laughs> um, but, but I think it's, I actually do think it's different. And I have to say, I've been a, you know, a professional libertarian for about 25 years, a little bit more. And uh, libertarianism, uh, you guys are like the Sith Lords of libertarianism. Yeah. You've infected libertarianism with anarchism. <laughs> and with you're logical consistency. And anarcho-capitalism. <laughs> nobody, nobody was talking about the non-aggression principle mm -hmm. 25 years ago. It was not the default definition of libertarianism. Oh, yeah? Well, no, because didn't know that. Absolutely but not. Because I'm new to this weird shit. Yeah. Well, your definition of libertarianism that you just gave, it's like it begs the question, why? I mean, you're like, okay, well, I think the state should be limited to this. I don't really want to spend my time fighting about this. Yeah. Maybe they could do this, but politics should not be a, this, smaller. I'm why? not a foundationalist. Why well, do you first believe off, that? I, I'm not a foundationalist. I don't really, like, first principles are interesting to talk about and things like that, but it is, I have a sensibility uh, that I should be free, that you should be free, that all of us should be free, um, and that this evening should have been free, but Thad insisted on charging a substantial amount of money uh, without even a buffet. I mean, we were at a debate last night Next where time. these guys performed in, in different ways, and $10 or $12, $24 get you a buffet, okay. as well as a debate. There but, were probably leftovers. But <laughs> they weren't beyond all of that, no, I, I mean, this is, uh, I think, the, the, role, the size, scope, and spending of government is something that we'll always be talking about. Because the minute, uh, you know, I don't, I don't think, I don't believe in pure anarchism, and I don't feel a need to create a foundational system on that. I know what I believe, and I'm comfortable with that, and I think I can show pragmatically it's good, and that morally, it, in general, it's better to give people more choice rather than less choice, and everything mm -hmm. kind of proceeds from that. But it's not an absolutist argument. But why are, why are you not an logic. anarchist? I don't get it. What's, what's holding it, you back it, there? It, it just, it, it's the it logical conclusion. It doesn't interest me. It's, it's a boring, sterile debate because in the end, and it's like, and that's why the government shouldn't do anything. And it's like, okay, and now what are we gonna do for our lifetimes? Because the government is gonna be here, the state is gonna be here, and what I would rather do is move in the direction of more freedom well, and, and figure out how to do that. Yeah, but and, and to your point, uh, uh, Thad and I uh, talked for a reason about Have, have I made earlier. points tonight? I don't remember, but get, go ahead. Yeah. Uh, no, but, um, you know, your, your renegades, right? Yeah, uh, yeah, the people, yeah. you know, the heroes, your spirit animal. Sure. You know, it's, it's kind, I think it, in a lot of ways it's a waste of time to be like, okay, I'm going to create this perfect system and then try to enforce it, mm -hmm. as opposed to let's just start living our lives. And, and well, we ignore laws that we don't like, and we uh, support laws that we do, and we try to change laws that we don't like. Don't. <laughs> <laughs>
But but because I'm about to support you. Uh, so, but shouldn't anarchism be the guiding standard or the guiding principle of libertarianism? Isn't it sort of what you should move toward at all times? Because it is the logical conclusion of your po of I, your I politics. Think smaller government. Yeah, I, I, it kind of, but not always. Unless because, you, un unless like, hang on, unless you actually are a semi-statist, you're a minarchist. It sounds like. And yeah, you, I am a minarchist. But are you committed yeah. to that in principle? In other words, do you do you think that government should control certain portions of the economy? Uh, I no, I don't think they should, but I accept that they are going to, oh. and then we move in that direction. Then what's the difference between us? Yeah, because I'm. Yeah, an this is already. I find this a very tedious art, uh, uh, conversation. Oh, I'm, well, <laughs> you know, because then we, now then we can go back to abortion well, no. if you want. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but uh, yeah. so for me, I don't know if you guys, I don't know if anyone knows this, yeah. but uh, I hesitate to even say this publicly. But on on policy questions, public policy questions, I'm with Dave. Like I'm with Ron Paul. Like my. <laughs> But hold Wait, on. So, so you, like Ron, Ron Paul, every year he was in Congress, introduced like a sanctity of life argument. Except that for that. All abortion. <laughs> so that's Except for that. Are. That's the one difference we have. No, but I mean, my voting record, if I were ever a congressperson, which I won't be, but would look pretty much like Ron Paul's. Okay? Now, yeah. now then I add a bunch of other stuff, like which I introduced last night, talking about the postmodernism mm -hmm. stuff. But... Uh, I, I do think it's it's if you're, you're going to take on libertarianism, you're always going to be haunted by the specter of the anarchists who are going to be telling you what you really should be, because that is so to what, me what the should, logical what conclusion should, of libertarianism. What should uh, should there be if public anti schools? Should, if, should there be public schools? No, okay. hell no. All right, given that public the, schools are the reason we're in the position we're in right now. By the way, this is the reason. Why we are we are where we are right now given, is because of public given schools. Given that there are public schools, so like what you would do if you were a legislator or if you're an activist, you would just be like, I am banning. I, I'm going to work for the banning of uh, uh, tax-funded schools. Period. Or are you going to be like, you know, what a, a policy that actually has a chance of being enacted and working and is happening is mm. something like charter schools or school vouchers or things that give people in any given situation more choices and more options that moves towards smaller government and more autonomy. That's that for me is like in terms of that's as much time as I want to spend devoted to politics and to policy. I, and I spent a lot of time talking about policy. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I think getting rid of capital controls. Like, I, I don't, you know, the, we don't need the government to print money uh, or anything like that. But in the meantime, you know, before that happens or before Bitcoin and crypto really takes off, um, we can move towards a world where the government can't, a state can't say, you can't take your money out of this country. Uh, you can't use supplementary uh, cash and currency and things like that. So it's like that's, I'm just pushing in those directions. Let's talk about schools, okay? And let's talk about children who are living. Okay, so Dave has just begun parenthood. Nick and I, we haven't ended it, but we just, we, uh, we both of our, both of, yeah. <laughs> we, we sort of are. Yeah. But the, uh, so Nick's uh, youngest kid has just graduated, well, recently graduated from high school, as has mine. So we're kind of at the end of that period so you're, the, you're entering. Intensive period. Yeah. Now we're in the, we're going to go bail him out of jail phase. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Now, um, what do we have to say to Dave? What do you want to say to Dave about that experience? How did you feel? How do you feel about parents? You told me last night or yesterday when we were hanging out that you know you have very mixed feelings about about now being an empty nester. Yeah, well, that I mean is uh, just a kind of sociological fact of you know you spend I mean, you're at the very beginning of this where right. it is uh, you're absolutely right that having a kid recenters your world and your your world gets recentered on the on the on the kid. Um, and then when they're out of the house, they don't need you as much mm -hmm. and you have to get on with your life. So there's that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. There's a larger question if we're talking about education and whatnot. It's my, my two sons, one's 25 and one just turned 18. They went to a mediocre uh, but well-rated public high school in a college town in Ohio. Mm -hmm. um, it was a terrible waste of time and money. Mm -hmm. um, you know, schools are minimum security prisons. They look exactly like minimum security prisons. Uh, there should be a million, given the amount of money, the billions of dollars that we spend on education, K through 12 and everything else, there should be a million different models of delivering education, including something like Renegade University, uh, you know, drive through, you know, everything. There should be, mm -hmm. you know, a, a education by drone delivery for fuck's sake um, and um, so this it's come a, a long way from charter schools yeah yeah <laughs> no, well, trust me but but it's like uh, you know what what would be good and what I think is doable what is achievable in the next year or the next 10 years is introducing more choice and more a, individualism and personalization of but education. are you for the abolition of public schools Nick Gillespie yes or no 
Yeah, I would love to see a day when, you know, I would love to see a day when the Air Force has enough money to bomb all the schools having bank <laughs> sales. Right? So you're a militarist yeah, so this, anarchist. Yeah. It's okay. very confusing. It's, it's not, my head yeah. is not a good place I gotcha. to live. I gotcha. Okay. Got you're the Curtis LeMay of anarchism. That's right. Okay. Of K through 12 education. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So I, you know, my son just, he just was released. I say he didn't, he didn't graduate. He re was released from his 13 year sentence. Uh, Dave, what are you going to do about schools? Um, I mean, I know it's early to think about know, this, but I, you got to, right? Well, what I, what I know is that I will not be sending my daughter to one of those government prisons. I promise that. Over my dead fucking body, will I ever put her in one of those Yes, prisons. my brother. Yes, my brother, but it ain't so easy, right? Because yeah, no. you gotta, someone's got to have the time and the resources to teach the kids, unless you don't want to teach them. Yeah. I mean, look, Which is I, fine, I get it. It's easy, like, it's easy to say... In, in, and it's almost like if someone doesn't have a kid and they're like, well, I will raise my kid in X, Y, and Z way. And they'll never else have has sugar, they'll like, never yeah. watch TV, sure. all of this kind of stuff. One of the great, uh, if you haven't had kids, uh, one of the great joys of being a parent is like hanging out with people who are like, well, you know, my kid is never going to have Kool-Aid. My kid is never going to watch TV. My kid is never going to do this. And within that, I'm sure you had this experience, within a couple of months, you go back to that place and the people are like shoving sugary sweets in front of their kid who is like sure. uh, oh, Alex the, in uh, the best, Clockwork Orange. The best know, like, was right in front of the TV. We will get back to Dave in a second, yeah. but I will say that uh, the, for me, I don't know if anybody knows about this, but Baby Einstein, this yeah, was, yeah, yeah. This, was yeah. this was this was heroin for babies, uh, which, you know, was horrifying, and it turns out it actually retarded their development in some oh, way, sure. but, but, but I didn't care. Parents, right? But hell yeah, yeah, man, I put my son right in front of that shit all morning long, so I had those precious three hours, and he was just like slack-jawed looking at the thing for three hours. loop of classical music and like really expensive toys. Yes. Kind of mo Total scam, yeah. but, but it just completely drugged them, and I yeah. was able to, you know, watch porn then. So anyway, <laughs> so... So I get it. So uh, back to you, Dave. Uh, <laughs> so, you know, New York City, it's going to be tough, isn't it? You know, you're busy. Your wife's probably busy. You know, you got lots of th things going on. You can't even get groceries without going through some hassle here. You can't you do got all you, those Buying bitches. diapers is a, is a pain in the ass. No, He's got the Jeff side Bezos bitches. figured yeah. this out. Oh, that's true. Yeah. Right. Everything's diapers delivered by drone right now. The... You got the drone delivery. So, no, but how are you going to, what are you thinking? Again, you got several years to figure this out, but what are you thinking? How are you going to do this? Are you going to homeschool? Private or home? Now that you're a Christian, that's what you should do, right? Yeah, yeah. one of the two. Really? Okay. That's that's what I'm thinking right now. But I don't know. We got you know we got a few years to work it out, and I also have to sell my wife on my you know craziness. But uh, she'll be. Uh, oh, uh, are there political differences in the home? No, my wife's not like very political, and mm. she more or less agrees with me. Mm -hmm. um, but on the school, th whatever we end up doing on the school thing, I have to kind of sell her mm -hmm. on my wife the most political thing i think that my wife which by the way is good for me because like if i was in a relationship with someone who was also super political i'd probably just lose my mind oh, like yeah. i need she's like my escape from this yeah you don't know, don't do that for uh, all but she her biggest political thing i think that she had before we met was that she just loathed modern feminism mm. like she was just like the, the they're out of their fucking mind and the, like so that was like her big thing and it, it kind of lined up and then we just fell in love and you know it's like the, she's not a super political person um but whatever i do schooling my daughter you know i'd have to I don't even like that term, schooling. It's yeah. like, that's not educating. I'm sorry. I shouldn't say that. Can I just say one thing? I'll be very yeah, quick with this. I, just about what we said before, like the case verse, whether, whether you should sit here and say, hey, I support the abolition of, of public school or I support like a charter school program or, you know, it's almost like saying I support the abolition of the income tax or I support a reduction of 10%. And, you know, what's more practical? This is, and by the way, this is from Gene Epstein. Uh, the host of uh, uh, the Soho Forum last night. And this is what he said, his uh, case for radicalism. And I love this. And he goes, look, if you were sitting around in 1840 and you said in 25 years, slavery is going to be abolished in the West, anyone, any reasonable, let's be practical person would have said, you're out of your fucking mind. Mm -hmm. Slavery's not going to be a... It's been this way forever. Mm -hmm. There's no chance. If you were sitting around in 1980 and you said in, in a little more than 10 years, the, the communism is going to fall, 
They'd be like, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. There's no chance of this. Yet all of those things happened. Yep. So I'm just saying, I think there's a strong case for radicalism. We live in a whole new era. If you're telling me education, now that you have, I have in my pocket every piece of information that's ever been written for, through all of human history, and you think I, we can't get rid of these government buildings with these same old lame, fucking sad, childless, middle-aged women fucking droning on government propaganda to our kids? We can't, we can't get rid of them. Of course we can. And it's almost, and, and this is, I don't think history is predetermined. Like, we decide what it's going to be. So instead of saying, let's take this position, let's just go for what's right. Abolish government schools. Let's save the fucking world. I think you just lost me another girlfriend. Because when, uh, when I had Malice on, Michael Malice on, for the first episode, yeah, of Ren Registered, he's, he called public teachers vermin. You may remember this. <laughs> Okay. Amen. So, you know, like, like, like Dave, I tend to date and, and be with women who are really not political in the ways that I am because it's hard to find women like that. Uh, and so they tend to be of the NPR, liberal Democratic Party variety, you know, so you kind of look for the most open-minded of those. But she has, and many of them have, lots of friends who are public school teachers. And she heard this episode and she said, <laughs> well, first of all, you know, malice was tough for her. But, but uh, the, uh, that was, it was an insult to her and all of her friends and everything she stood for. And it was a real problem for me. So I, you know, now I'm worried that the, the, the new woman I'm dating, who also knows a lot of, uh, she has, knows a lot of teachers, you've just ruined it for me, thanks man. Hanging out with libertarians is dangerous. Yeah. It At is. least for your love life. So, uh, but I agree with you entirely. I, I feel about uh, public school teachers the way Donald Trump feels about Mexicans. I'm sure some of them are good people, <laughs> but they're not sending their best. You what know what I mean? Like, they're, yeah. they're rapists, they're oh, criminals, fuck. and some, I'm sure, yeah. are good people. But I was just, I was just in Oakland. I was just in Oakland, and I guess the teachers just went on strike there. And so, of course, all these idiot liberals all over Oakland have all these signs saying, "We stand with the teachers of Oakland." And I actually got to the point where, and of course, they have them in front of their houses, in front of their like signs to say, "Black Lives Matter," and everyone's welcome here. And that's you know the bravest thing possible to say in Berkeley, California, right? Uh, and by the way, are you going to allow refugees into your home? Is that what that means? But um, you know, I would, I would see these signs that say, "We stand with teachers," and I actually got to the point where I would stand and I was so infuriated. I was like standing in front of their house and say, do you, did you like any of your teachers? You know, I would, I would confront you. Did you name one of your teachers in all 13 years who you like, how many were there? Why do you stand with these assholes? They tortured me every fucking year, right? It's like this cognitive dissonance among liberals. They, they ask a person who's a liberal, ask anybody, how many of your teachers, if they went to public schools, right? How many teachers did they actually like? Did they actually get educated by? And they'll say, oh, maybe one or two, which was like me. I said one. One out of 13 years of all those people. But yet again, when it comes to the teachers' unions and teachers generally, when they think in the abstract, because the left, of course, love to, lo loves to think about people in the abstract, not actual human beings in front of them, right? They'll all say, oh my God, we've got to give them more funding and more help, and we've got to support them, and what heroes they are. No, teachers in public schools, right guys, are not heroes. They were not my heroes, they were my enemies. Can we extend this a little bit to get off of the libertarian hobby horse? The man who works for a libertarian <laughs> publication says. I'd love to. Um, Sports, isn't what do we want to do? About? No, isn't it true though that most teachers at private schools suck just as bad and it's exactly the same model? It's exactly the same the, model. This is what the I hear, but I'm not rich enough to I know. Went, I yeah. went to a parochial Catholic school. It cost like a couple hundred dollars a year. I went to a high school that I paid for. The teachers there were not good. I, should, I, I tried to get my parents to allow me to go to the public school because <laughs> the education was better there. What I'm saying is uh, we should also be thinking broader than just in terms of very like state versus non-state actors. The models of education are oppressive, they're imperialistic, to use a term you like. Uh, they are the antithesis of actually allowing people to develop and grow and to flourish and to you know, cultivate their individuality. So I, I completely agree with the second part of that, but not so much with the first part. So I do agree that the whole model needs to be Blown we need to completely rethink yeah. this. I mean, the idea, if you just think about the, the, the concept of how much technology has evolved 
and yet the the idea of school, this Prussian model of school, yeah. that we still go, you yeah. you sit the precursors to the Nazis. These are who came up with the whole concept of school, right? Correct. I mean, like like that's some real that like this is about indoctrinating children and the idea yeah. of like and sit in a row of yeah. desks and memorize and regurgitate. Like when did we decide this is how our children should be brought into the world? If you look at like little kids, like three, four year olds, they have this intense instinct for for two things number one they want to know they, that's the old joke like kids they go why 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 like they keep asking you why because they want to know and the other thing they really want is to participate in the adult world like you have to pretend they so participate. this is going to end with you, you saying you want to bring back child labor, right? <laughs> well, I mean, you know, well, maybe. I don't know if there should be laws. Actually, any, anything that's actually, peaceful. It anything could, that's peaceful. We have child yeah. labor right now, but it's just for the state in these public schools. I'm Ooh. just saying, you, you know these kids, Ooh. three-year-olds, you, you go like, they'll literally want to stir something while their mom's baking, or their dad's baking. And, uh, and, and then at the end, when you have the brownies, they're like, we made brownies, and I helped. Like, they love that. They want to know stuff. They want to help. Why are you spending they... so much time with other people's kids? And you're like, you're out on a weeknight oh, with your, and you're leaving your own kid. To, you know, what are they up to? My nephew. Oh, what are you okay. assuming is going on here? It's, uh, we've said very. But I'm just saying, and then you take that creative energy and you stick it in this memorize, regurgitate, memor it, it's horrible. It's, it's, it's evil. Like, I don't know what else to say about it. But that being said, as someone who went to public school and private school, there's a reason. Reason why these parents are paying so much money to get their kids in Yeah, it's school. a class it is, thing. It's no, a, no, no, it's, no. It's a, a, no, man. No, sorry, it's Dave. better. You, all, it is all better. Schools you do. actually learn yeah. something. And I thought the private school I went to sucked balls, but the public school I went to was downright criminal. Like, I, as a libertarian, I go, some of these people should have been arrested mm -hmm. for what they were doing. I mean, I'm talking about physical talking abuse, about threats group. of yeah, physical sure. abuse daily. Now, maybe there was one teacher who was good in that whole building, but there mm -hmm. were straight up criminals I was, in that I building. was thrown into a closet once by a substitute teacher. I was thrown through a door and my sixth grade teacher at Columbus Middle School in Berkeley, California, Mr. Perone, love that guy. He used to pick us up by the seat of our pants <laughs> and just carry us across the room and then drop us when we were, like when we were the, out of order. The fact of education and educational achievement is that it, it tracks very closely with parental achievement. Mm -hmm. So. You know, it's like you guys can talk about all of this, but this is a place for a Marxist critique uh -oh. of it. And there's no question that public schools and private schools are set up in order to uh, recapitulate or replicate the existing class and status order. Yes. And that is the reason why there is no fucking way. Like I have my sister is a dean of students at Notre Dame. The kids going in there, they're not learning any more wow. at Notre Dame than they are at Indiana University. Right. But they come in at a higher level of income and they come out on a, somewhat on a higher level mm -hmm. of income. But the, the, they're not learning anything more. This is selecting for peer effects and things like yeah, that. Yeah, the poor get trapped yeah. in these public schools, and of that, course. by the way, is one of the reasons why I agree with, you know, if we can get rid of state-sponsored uh, education, because I don't, I, don't, I don't think the role of education should be the creation of good citizens, which is the Prussian model uh, right. tied to a, a kind of industrial Me factory meaning, model. Meaning, specifically, meaning good workers and good soldiers. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Which was yeah. Explicit, yeah. by yes. the way, in this country. You said yeah. you asked when it began. This was in the 1830s in America. Horace Mann, who, yes. found, yeah. who actually founded my college, Antioch College in Ohio. He uh, that's exactly. He was explicit about it. We need we need workers in the factories that are beginning to develop here in the United right. States, and we need soldiers to fight in all the wars we're about to, to embark yeah. on as imperial as an imperialist country. It's explicitly. Uh, what, that's why the, that's why schools are designed as assembly lines what, with the of, bells and the moving of the children from spot to spot, doing one task after another. One of the things that I think can be done and has been done and this is where charter schools you know and it's not it's not sexy it's not as sexy as like rock and roll high school where the Ramones blow up Vince Lombardi high at the end um, but you know charter schools give poor people choices that they wouldn't have other not in five years and not in ten years but like next in the fall and that's good so and, and again I I'm not saying it's I mean I, when it comes to politics and I guess this goes back to the anarcho-capitalism versus libertarian thing I'm just not a utopian like I don't care enough about politics to be utopian and all I want uh, I'm I'm happy to spend a little bit of time thinking about it and trying to make marginal increases in autonomy and freedom and things like that and then I want to spend most of my time reading and writing the stuff that I'm interested in and kind of living my but life. An, but anarcho-capitalism and the, anarch the anarchism that I'm attracted to is not utopian. 
I mean, right? You don't hear. I think it's the, I think it's the uh, I, I never, antithesis of, of yeah. utopia. I never hear. I think yeah. it's, it's well, no, but it is in that we want the absolute destruction of the state. Yeah, but they don't. No, but but no. ANCAP, sorry, but ANCAPs don't talk about utopia. Marxists talk about utopia. Socialists talk about utopia. But I've never heard an ANCAP describe the perfect society that's going to arrive once we, you know, eliminate the state. Right? They just, I also well, well I, I think it's more utopian. About. It's much more utopian to think that we're going to have a state that will remain small mm. than it is to think that we could abolish the state. I mean, look. What more proof do you need that a state, the United States of America, the country that we live in right now, was all founded by these guys who had really thought about the checks and balances and the power of the state. Yeah, these geniuses. That's, that's we are true. sitting in the biggest state that has ever existed in the history Dave, of humanity. Are you more free? Are you more free than your your parents were? Just um, and not not in terms of like is the state bigger in terms of the amount of both money. Both are true. The Except, state is bigger, yeah. and I am yeah, freer. So that's all I'm saying. Like, mm. right? I'm, but I'm we willing, don't. I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna burn. Yes. The, you know, the last hundred and twenty years or whatever I have, or hundred and forty years I have left, <laughs> but trying to get down to zero there because it's like okay. I can be more free now, and anything. I'm not gonna be able to like. I'm not gonna be able to. I'm not gonna be able to uh, strangle the. Uh, you know, put the state in a bathtub and strangle it. Uh, but like let me, a uh, like a fetus. Okay. Guess, right? it's a kid, sure. Be well, there'd be no. Even yeah. in the second I'd trimester. Find okay. <laughs> well, look, I'll, I'm going to borrow a thought from the uh, the uh, brilliant Scott Horton, who's one of my very good friends, who's been on the right podcast on. before. Yep. And like what he said, well, look, if you're judging the Soviet Union, okay, you don't judge the Soviet Union like morally or, or you know judge them as a society by how the wealthy politically connected in the outskirts of Moscow lived. You judge them by the gulags. You judge them by the people in Afghanistan being carpet bombed. That's how you judge them. So if you're judging our state today, you don't judge it by the fact that I'm a little bit freer mm. than my parents are. No, but you everybody, judge them everybody, by, by the, no, well, let me just finish, is. hold on, let me just finish my thought. You judge them by the prison industrial complex. You judge them by the million dead in Iraq. You judge them by the genocide going on right now in, Af in, in Yemen, okay? Where there's babies starving to death because our state, this powerful state, has signed off on the Saudi war, okay? Which is really our war. So that is, yeah, I am a little bit freer then my mother was uh, okay, but my point about a state, my point is that the utopian model is that we could have a limited state that this power, uh, this this group that has a monopoly on, on uh, aggression, a, mon a monopoly on the initiation of force, they'll be in charge of limiting their own power and they will keep it limited. Uh, what, what, so Nick, Nick, what were you getting at with this? What was the question? You're saying there's more state, and but what, Dave is freer, so what's, you know, what here, are you getting at? What, there is a paradox and there's a limitation to libertarian thinking, I think, or, or, nar or narco capitalists, which, and, and you hear various people talk about this, that if the state grows, uh, individual freedom or liberty uh, shrinks. You know, it's a zero-sum game. That's it, okay. I think that is fundamentally false, and here is one thing I'll say, as a libertarian, one of the ways that we need to free our minds to really get to a space that would develop a world that's very different, if we spend all of your, if you spend all of your time muttering under your breath about a fucking state and this and that and this and that, you are wasting valuable energy that could go into the creation of an alternative world that you could be living in right now. That's all. And, and again, I don't, I actually, you know, this, this is not really, um, you know, a, a, a win or lose kind of conversation or something like that. What I'm saying is we need to be thinking much more broadly about what does human freedom mean? And I actually, and this is where I think libertarians and, and anarchists are different. I do think that there are a lot of people who are going to come into the world for reasons that they are not responsible for, where they will have no chance at actually kind of fulfilling their promise or exercising their autonomy. And that is a place where collective action and it's going to i think it's mostly going to be done through the state it doesn't have to be can help and it can give people who have no means who have no connections who have no parents um, you know a little bit a, a step up so that maybe they can live a life that's closer to what they would have uh, lived had they been born under better circumstances mm -hmm. that's all what do you think dave um, i i I, you know, it, there, there's kind of a difference between freedom and liberty. So the reason why we have more freedom today is because of the market growing, mm -hmm. because of technological advances. Yeah. I mean, that's where the freedom comes from. But the state growing bigger and bigger does come at the expense of liberty. So you might be in a situation where, look, I mean, you, you could argue that somebody who's sitting in a jail cell today in America has more 
a higher that's standard of living that than a middle somebody class person in the depression, right? Or well, something. well, yeah. yeah. Yes. I mean, no, you I know, mean, maybe, you silly, but they right? have yeah. far less liberty. So yeah. the state comes at the expense of liberty, not necessarily freedom. And all of the advances that we've had have come from technological innovations. Absolutely. And those will be crushed if the state keeps growing bigger and bigger. Mm -hmm. So no, but they are. They're I not. The state keeps growing bigger and bigger, and technological innovation changes more and more. Stuff. That, that seems like a question. That seems like a fundamentally anti libertarian argument you're saying no, that all i'm saying is like don't fucking uh, don't waste all of your time but, worrying about but the that's state. what socialists in this fucking neighborhood tell me all the time right no, which no, is because they're which obsessed, is that don't worry they're well, obsessed with the state and growing the state i mean could, this is no no, no uh, but, but i say the same i say i say what dave's been saying which is to them to these communists when they're on my show and when i meet them on the streets when they're not yelling at me uh that you know they say don't worry that you're very paranoid of course there's going to be freedom under you know a, a giant state apparatus and in fact the the more the state is, the more that the larger the state is, the more freedom is there is. So I, you're sounding like a Marxist again, no, you see, and you sounded like a Marxist yesterday, by the yeah, way. Yeah, well, you know, and I, and if, so I'm if, worried about you. If past performance is any indication of future outcomes, I'll sound like a Marxist tomorrow. Okay. So, so, um, <laughs> but I mean, no, no, no. But what, what? I, because I'm not saying I don't want the state to be larger. I okay. want the state to be more limited. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. But, you know, it it just fundamentally. I'm not interested in having a long, drawn-out conversation about how do you get to zero. My question is how do you get closer to zero? How do you move in that direction? And then also recognizing that, you know what, like, you know, wonderful things happen all of the time because of free markets, because of innovations, because, and actually it's not even economics. Like I, I also think the libertarian movement and the ANCAP stuff, it's too focused on economics. What, what makes people free are people who say, fuck it, I am living the way I want. Yes. And I, I'm, not, I'm not gonna be talking about marginal utility and blah, blah, blah. It's like, I am deciding how to live my life the way I want to, that, taking risks. There's a great that. book about that's, that. That's it's called so A Renegade History of the United States. <laughs> yeah. the, by the way, a phenomenal book, well, thank which you. I really very Absolutely. much uh, enjoyed. Yeah. Um, I would but love the, to I think see that's that a false choice. into into the you know the national high school curriculum. Yeah. Oh, so it would would I, we're working on it. In fact, who is the teacher here? Right here is going to teach my teach my book in a in a cat. Get by this. The way, that's fucking awesome. No, don't. It gets better. You'll you'll appreciate this in a Catholic girls' school. Oh, yeah. this is, who so would have thought that's gonna that would well. be where the libertarian yeah. revolution yeah. starts? For, for, yeah. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, like a recent episode of Unregistered is me talking to a high school class, a public high school class in Sacramento, which uh, was quite interesting. You might want to check it out. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, I just don't, I, to me, I think it's a false choice to say you can either talk about marginal utility or you can live your life the uh, way well, you want to live you, it. But no, well, let okay. me just get, you know, let me, I, look, I'm saying, who is a better example of living their life the way you want to live it than me? I'm a comedian podcaster, <laughs> and I support my family off of this. Like, I'm doing very well. I am doing that. However, to say, let's just not pay attention to the state. Like, okay, let's not, be, oh, okay, well, how about those fucking babies starving to death in Yemen right now? Mm -hmm. How about the yeah. people rotting away in fucking cages all around us? So, okay, let's just not pay attention to that. that let's just not pay attention yeah, to the no, fact no, no, that, that all these people, but it's that's, like, that's, no, that's, that's what's happening here. So if we don't pay attention to the state, that's what we're ignoring. That's, a false choice because I and I work for uh, my job is to like I've, I've written my entire life against every military intervention that the Ameri uh, that the US government has mm -hmm. done I've, I've written against prison policies I've written in favor of uh, ending drug prohibition I've, I've written in favor of drug use I mean these are like you know so uh, right. you know in a weird way maybe you are doing more of the world that I say I should be doing and you know I am doing more of the world <laughs> that you're saying you're doing because all I do is fucking write about how the government mm -hmm. is too big it's in efficient it's bad what I'm getting at is a broader I hope a broader conception of saying you know if if libertarians are obsessed to the point of uh, distraction with the size of government every time and in all ways I think we are shutting down a portion of our brains and our energy that could be devoted to just getting on with freedom that's all I and, I, and I think that's more of a personal uh, kind of predilection or uh, uh, you know a, a default setting I, 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 I would never argue that this is what everybody should believe or anything like that Can I, we I just take the opposite I think that the greatest um, struggle in human history is tyranny versus liberty there is nothing that uh, that that has been the, the greatest tyranny by far has been the state not to say there aren't others but it, there's yeah. nothing that could even come close to comparing to it mm -hmm. um, or competing with it um, 
and there's nothing better you could spend your time on than that. And you could say, well, yes, I don't like so the your war. Stand up, the your stand-up is ending the war in Yemen? Yes. Uh, no, and I'm, I'm, yes. Not, I'm not saying no, but it's like, yeah, then we're doing the same work, right? Okay. No, I'm not, I'm not, it's not an attack on you as a person. I'm disagreeing with what you just said. And I'm saying that if, that if you, like, it, you can't separate, well, there's this war on Yemen, and then there's the, also, like, the, these people sitting in cages, and this is, but then there's just, like, the economic stuff, which we don't need to waste all our time with. Do you know what the income tax is? Do you know what it's done to people? What it's done to families? You know how many people have been ruined? How many divorces, suicides, do you, do you destroyed? Destroyed families do you over the fucking over the debtors ask, prison. Wait, wait. wait. Uh, do you seriously do you equate um, the indiscriminate bombing of absolutely you know uh, innocent people in foreign countries, or you know systematically putting whole populations of uh, of bad ethnic groups in jail for the, their lives with? Uh, the difference between paying 39.6 percent uh, as a top marginal rate and 30, well, you know, 30. No, 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 like it, no, 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 no. It's a... that it's theft, right? That it's all theft. It doesn't matter what the percentage is. Is your position, right? Yes. So it's theft, obviously, uh, one is worse than the other. Well, but they're all evil. It's pretty damn bad either way. Yeah. I mean, I, I I'm sympathetic to all yeah. of what Dave is saying. That's why I love the guy. But let me let me get. Do you guys want to continue talking about libertarianism? Sure, why not? Uh, so, <laughs> <laughs> so you raised an interesting question. This is where I will start to probably agree with you more and less with Dave. We'll see. So Dave, you are sort of, a, you're associated with, you're close to guys I very much love in many ways and I've learned a lot from like Tom Woods and people from the sort of Mises world there. I'm and going you, to Mises University in two days. Mises University. And, is, and you uh, are. What, is, what, uh, what sports division are they in? Are they going to crack the uh, SEC? The, or? They're D6. Yeah. Um, <laughs> they got a sweet women's field yeah. hockey team. Yeah, that's what that, yeah. uh, 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 so, Nick says that libertarians are too narrowly focused on things like economics and the state. I agree, and I think especially the, from the, the Mises Caucus types. So, Dave, you're involved with the Mises Caucus of the Libertarian Party, and that's that, those guys. Now, I have learned a ton about economics and the state from just those people. I used to be a huge Tom Woods fan. I studied it for like two straight years, and that's where I learned all the economics I could because, as you know, as a leftist in graduate schools, they don't teach you anything about economics. So, thank you for them uh, and for that. But what I said last night and what I've been saying for a long time is that one of the reasons I don't identify as a libertarian is that, yes, I think they tend to be too narrowly focused on those things, economics and the state and what Marxists call the material conditions of life, which are important, but they are not all of reality. And it seems to me, interestingly, that the hardcore ANCAPs in the movement, in the libertarian movement, share that with Marxists. Um, so there are, there are forms, as M Mr. Foucault, my man, M Michel Foucault, has, has says, there are forms of power that have nothing to do with the state, that are outside the state, but that undergird state power. So like what he calls norms, social norms. Without social norms, there are no laws, right? Without norms undergirding the laws, there are no laws. It is illegal to jaywalk in New York City, as everyone knows, but every single person in New York City jaywalks, right? Because there yeah. is no norm undergirding it, right? So... Uh, Nick, can you sort of lay out a little bit what you mean about what is missing in libertarianism? What what layers would you like to add to it that are that are not there right now? Um, so an appreciation for experiments in living, uh, for yeah. instance, a, a kind of like John Stuart Mill concept. And again, this is not these are not either or things, but it's like where are people right now uh, inhabiting or creating? interesting uh, communities, new types of institutions, mm. new methods of living, new lifestyles. Yeah. Um, what kind of art are they creating? How are they imagining what, it, what it's going to be like to be human in, in 25 years or whatever? So things like transhumanism, mm. uh, the idea of people doing kind of self-directed evolution. Mm. And again, this is not to the exclusion of saying, and so let's not worry about Yemen, <laughs> because I, you know, we do need to be you know, talking about all of this stuff. But an appreciation for lit, what I would consider like kind of lived freedom or lived liberty. Yes. Because it's happening all over the place in all sorts of interesting ways and in ways that undercut a lot of the tyranny of the norms that, you know, that you're talking about yep. uh, or a Foucauldian reading, which would be, um, you know, like in a, in a way you don't need, you don't need laws 
uh, to make gay people equal in society mm -hmm. if they're treated equally. That's right. Um, and that it's kind of or the if, laws Or if they're up. considered to be equal. Yeah. That's, and, the norm. And, and, That's the norm. And, and right. just yeah. uh, as a perfect example for what you guys are saying, I mean, look at, there, there's no better uh, example of culture affecting politics than all of the politicians who used to say marriage is between a man, a man and a woman, as soon as people were basically like, no, that's bullshit, yeah. and the yeah, opinion polls were over 50%, yeah. they all went, hey, we've been thinking about and it. And they're getting yeah, yeah, hot and stuff. Yeah, yeah. As, sure. So, yeah. so, you know, I, I think you're right about that. But, like, I agree with all of that. And I also, I mean, the thing that comes to my mind is just being, a, like, I, I was a huge comedy fan before I became a comedian. And I love watch like, great comedy. I, Dave Chappelle or Bill Burr or Louis C.K., Pre and post jerk off, <laughs> um, but I like. Uh, Did and, he and ever a lot of masturbate I liked in front him, of you? I liked him during. Yeah, never actually. got offered. <laughs> yeah. it was pretty, and I was hanging out, just like yeah. so. What are you up to later? <laughs> yeah, you got a hotel room or anything? <laughs> Nothing. Um, but and a lot of what they'll do is really great comedy, high level. George Carlin, a lot of these guys. What they'll do is they'll make you think about something that's always been a preconceived, like like just a a, a belief of yours, and go, wow. I've never thought about it that way. So I'm all for, but to me, this is almost like, I look at libertarianism as a limited uh, uh, philosophy, but I don't think that that's a bad thing. To me, libertarianism is abolitionism. It's the, it's the same thing as being an abolitionist. Now, you could go to an abolitionist and be like, you know, this is the, the idea that you want to abolish slavery. I mean, this is kind of a limited philosophy. What job should the slave get at when, once they're a free person? And you're like, yeah, 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 that's important too. But all I'm saying is they shouldn't be a fucking slave. Like, that's my point. And that's what abolition, uh, abolitionism is. So that, to me, is what libertarianism is. It's not saying there's so no a, more to life than it's that. It's a political philosophy. It's a Ultimately, legal philosophy, yeah, yes. Okay. Legal yeah. It's about the relationship between the individual and the state. Yeah, it, and, it's about... And I guess... And this is where it's limited yeah, well, for you and, and for, for me. For, for I, and me, I agree. It's like, limited. I agree with everything, yeah, every position no. you take on that, but it's it, there's more to life than that, and there's of more course. to politics, more, more to and, politics than that. And that we should be libertarian in all aspects of our lives, because some people, and I think some people at the Mises Institute will say something like this, where libertarianism is a, is a political philosophy. It has nothing to say about how you might live your private life, or right. your business life, or something that isn't about the, the well, role of the state and kind of coercion. However, they actually do. They actually pretty much shame people for certain forms of living. Okay, that I don't know because what, I'm not what, that how familiar with that. the Mises Institute that, does? But, yeah. yeah. Uh, okay, but, how so? Well, I mean, there's a long history of it. Uh, going but back to the Ron Paul say, newsletters, yeah, right? All I, mean, I was going to say but, is that like, you should be libertarian no, through... You, you I don't want to... I don't want to... everything. Yeah, I mean, yeah, but this it, is like what I can't stand, man. It's like going back to the newsletters. It's like, okay, look, man, there were some things that were written... to the newsletters. <laughs> Do you have newsletters? Do you have newsletters in your past that you're worried people are going to find? It's it's not like a small thing. I'm young. I don't have newsletters in my past. <laughs> I'm so <laughs> fucking old did newsletters. You, did, you, did you mimeograph yeah. your, your yeah. newsletters, Dave? I have tweets exactly. that I'm not so proud of. <laughs> um, yeah. But no, but this is just like, it's like, look, okay, fine. I just don't. It's like where, look, man, I think all of us, like, it's easy to say, like, this public school system, the media, Hollywood, all this stuff, right? They're, like, programming these kids. Mm -hmm. But then sometimes you step back and go, well, how am I programmed? Like, how have we all been programmed? Because if you're so offended, here's, here's a perfect example of, of this, right? Okay, so Nick Sarwak, who I'll be debating at the Soho Forum, he is the chairman of the LP, right? He's outraged that Murray Rothbard said something nice about David Duke in the 90s, right? Because, and by the way, if you actually go read the article, I highly recommend you do. It's called The Case for Right-Wing Populism mm -hmm. by Murray Rothbard. I'm a Jew. I support everything he said in that article. He didn't know David Duke was going to go turn again later and start saying more crazy shit. Forget it. Feel wait, wait, let no, me, that's, let me that's, just that's, make that's the just made Nick, up, let me finish. David uh, Duke emerges as a Ku Klux Klan leader. It's not like, yes. oh, and then he dabbled in this or something. Okay, it's Nick, a fucked up, Nick, stupid let me point that Murray Rothbard made. And that's the point. Okay, can I can I finish yes. what I was saying now? So maybe you'd, so. you'd get it. Yes, in his twenties he was in the Clan. That like uh, again, if you're a leftist oh, yeah. and you're how many of you? Clan Nick, members? let me fucking finish oh, a yeah. point. Oh, yeah. 
Nick, Nick, like, th th that's up. what I, 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 dude, it's like, okay, yeah. let me just get the point out, yeah. okay? And I bet you the room will agree with me when I'm done, okay? So, yes, if you were a leftist, by the way, who in his 20s was in some radical leftist group and then moved into the center, everyone would fucking praise you for moving into the center, which is, by the way, the point Rothbard made if you actually go read the piece. But so, yes, so Nick Sarwak is outraged that Murray Rothbard said something nice about David Duke. And everyone here could go, man, David Duke, bad guy, racist, hates Jews, that's not cool. You shouldn't say so. Nick Sarwak praised John McCain when he died. Mm -hmm. Do you know how much fucking worse John McCain is than David Duke? Mm -hmm. You want to compare the two of them? Do you want to do you want to think about that one guy who says mean things and another guy who has mountains of corpses on his hands? Mm -hmm. You want to compare their track record? Mm -hmm. so, that's so that's all I'm the limit. saying. That's the limit of libertarian politics. You're either fucking uh, you you're a lover of John McCain or of David Duke. Fuck See, you. Yeah. Fuck you. That's an ANCAP. It ain't my libertarian. Okay. Is, do you think like, that's I, what I, I just said? I, Does anyone think no, that that's the point think, that I was making? No, but you just, no, my point is that why no. are we why are we so upset that someone in the 90s said, oh, you know what, yeah, stop okay, the Dave, LA riots. Dave, they yeah. wanted to go collect their welfare checks. Okay, okay. you shouldn't have said okay. that. But how about just saying, oh, I fucking, I, you know, Bill Weld, the LP nominee goes, um, you know, Hillary Clinton, we disagree on some economic issues. That's a, that to me is 100,000 times more offensive than anything that came out of the Mises Institute in the 90s, okay? I'm sorry. Like that is, that is you're, you're, you don't say Hillary Clinton should burn in fucking hell for what she did to Libya. You don't, but yet, so my point is where, it's not saying it's one or the other. My point is where are our moral priorities yeah. really? Nice. Okay, uh, you know what, I'll, I'll tell you this. The problem with associating with wh white racists or white supremacists or with status monsters is that it makes libertarian a harder sell to people who don't already agree with us. And if you think that like people who were like hanging out or saying kind words about uh, Ku Klux Klan leaders and stuff like that, that that doesn't matter to people, it does matter to people. Mm -hmm. And it's like it should guide how you act now and how you go forward. I don't give a shit about Murray Rothbard, I don't give a shit about the Mises Institute, I don't care about uh, Bill Weld. I, like, what I'm interested in is taking a sensibility and a philosophy that is about limiting government and increasing individual autonomy and freedom and respect and tolerance for people who want to live the weirdest fucking lives that we ever want to live, as long as it's peaceful. I want to sell that idea to more and more people. I, I and agree with you. And that is why Murray Rothbard makes that much, much harder because he was always willing to like extend an olive branch to fucking racists, okay? And not just I, not I, just I, not just racists, yeah. not just racists, but statists. Yeah. Oh, right? man. Okay. Let me, well, they listen. are. So, no, but that's that's why. I'm, but no one seems to have a problem. Them. But you don't have a problem as someone who's who's anti-statist or accused me of being statist earlier. You don't. Everyone. No one seems to have a problem with Murray Rothbard extending an olive branch to the new left in the '60s, who were like straight up sympathetic to socialism because they were anti-war. Because he always extended an olive branch an olive branch to the anti-war crowd because he like me, and this is why he's my fucking you know like my, my spirit animal yes why he is the guy who has more yeah. influence on me than anyone else yeah. is because he realized that mass murder was a more important thing to be against than to be against some uh, uh, look look man and if, as your point Nick let me just say that and this is my challenge to you right when you say this will make it a harder way to sell libertarianism at your next event at the next Reason Magazine event, okay. that's your people there. Ask the audience, who sold them libertarianism more? Was it Ron Paul or Gary Johnson? And you tell me <laughs> who was able to sell the message of libertarianism no, more. Is, and I, I don't care if he gave a speech in front of a Confederate and, flag once. I don't and, care. And what happened was that Ron Paul's message in 2008 in particular was great. And we've talked about this where he said, I don't want to run your, uh, you know, I don't want to run the economy. I don't want to run your life and I don't want to run the world. That's a great message. And then what happens is, you know, we have imperfect messengers of this kind of stuff and none of this, I like Ron Paul a lot and I think he's done, done a tremendous, uh, you know, uh, amount of work in, in making libertarianism you know, somehow relevant, yeah. um, but you, you're also like, you, now you're getting to a point where you're defending, oh, well, it's just, you know, he just hung out with a couple of racists. He just said a couple things. Why do we, well, I'm not picking up anybody's baggage anymore. Like, I don't, I don't need that, because okay. I never thought about it that way. I guess, I, look, I don't like racists. I don't like, I don't, to be honest, I'm not completely sure what the word means. 
Like I, I don't even. I, I really. I well, swear to God, the word, the term racism, to me, it seems like in in the modern context in 2019, can is is a spectrum from genocide to saying the blacks instead of blacks. Like, I, I swear to God, I'm not even like exaggerating. I don't know what the term means anymore. If you mean genocide, slavery, Jim Crow, something like that, yeah, burn in fucking hell, you're evil. If you mean someone who holds some views that are not like politically correct, that, then by the way, that's all of us, if we're being really honest with ourselves. So no, I don't no, even no, know. That's wrong. That's wrong. Dave, hold on. Let me, let me uh, uh, interject here into my own show. Uh, so, uh... <laughs> by the way, I love Nick Gillespie, and I hope. Everybody knows he, this, he, just, I hates, love he just hates Italian American. That's it. <laughs> is that I married an Italian American? Yeah. So yes, he's so correct. Boy, he's got, I hate what I'm trying to say. Is, yes, hate, I hate have I you noticed he has an answer for everything? Can I? No, let me ask you, Dave, 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 Dave. So here's the thing. Uh, There are many libertarians, some of whom you hang out with, some of whom are associated with Mises, but others too, Mm -hmm. who simply, as far as I can tell, never mention race. They never mention gender. They never mention sexism. They never mention cultural norms at all, right? And what does that mean? I mean, if you go, if you go to the Lou Rockwell report, you won't see any mention of that one way or the other. You won't see anything that's racist. You just won't see anything that's about race at all. Why is that? And well, don't you that's, think that's a problem? Because this is kind of what Nick's been, been, been getting at and what I've been getting at is that they're just whole swaths of the human experience that they simply don't address. And I don't know if that means they're racist, although I suspect it might, but it's simply that they're not interested in much of what life is for human oh, beings. Thank you so much, brother. Um, I, well, I can say that that's, that's flat out false. The idea really? that, that there's no address of race in a, on the Mises website. I mean, Mises.org has addressed everything. Have you seen their archives? Go go to Mises.org right now. Let's do it while we're here and type in race. I guarantee you there's articles that are written on it. Go to LouRockwell.com. I mean, they have this huge archive. So I don't know that that's true. But again, I don't exactly know. It's like going to like some website that's dedicated to the abolition of slavery can and I, saying you guys never talk about cooking. Can I, like, can I, oh, okay, can I, but... Can I tell you why I think they don't ever talk about race, even though you think they do? <laughs> it's the same reason that a lot of hardcore Marxists, including Bernie Sanders, don't talk about race. And Bernie Sanders didn't talk about race until the Black Lives Matter chicks got on the stage with him in Arizona and forced him to, by the way, during the campaign. Remember that? Pushed them off. Remember that? He was yeah. like, not, he was like, yeah. Black Lives Matter, what's that? Uh, yeah. Because, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a good argument, I mean, it's not the one I would make, but for, for both... In both cases, so the socialists say, once we have socialism, there will no longer be racism, right? Once we have economic equality, there will be no need for racism. That's the classic argument. That's Bernie Sanders' argument. It's always dragged into this identity politics by BLM. I think that a lot of hardcore libertarians, especially some ANCAPs, especially some people around the Mises Institute, but others, you know, say similar things. They will say, once the state is abolished, right, we will have no racism because we will have freedom and then no one will need to be racist. And I think that might be a problem. Well, I don't, I've never actually heard anyone from Mises say that. Or sexism. Or so, but any, I, I've, what or, I've heard them Or any say, negative cultural norms at all, right? Well, so what I heard Murray Rothbard write, or heard, what I read Murray Rothbard write, was that the, uh, the Black Power movement and the Black Panthers were absolutely right when they said that the police don't work for them. He mm-hmm. was like, you're right, mm-hmm. the police don't work for them, mm-hmm. if, don't work for you, mm-hmm. and you should leave this system and you shouldn't be like responsible to these police. Mm-hmm. You should develop your own police networks. Uh, I heard Ron Paul say that to him, Martin Luther King was a hero because he, he, you know, like his message was consistent with nonviolence and peace. So I don't know. I haven't actually heard them say anything like that. What I've heard Ron Paul say is that, uh, who who isn't technically Mises Institute, but is associated with them. Um, What I've heard him say is that he thinks racism is essentially a form of collectivism and that there's, it's kind of evil and repugnant and that you should judge people as individuals. But I don't think the, what, like what I've heard them, the, a lot of different people from the Mises Institute argue is that the best way to deal with the problem of racism is to have a market and a fr- as free a market as possible. And by the way, if you don't think that's true, I mean, just look at the world. If you don't think that the free market is the best solution to racism, just think about it this way. Go on YouTube, look at every political video from the left and the right and the alt-right and Trump and the, what, what's the, the name of these uh, four congressmen? The, uh, uh, the squad. The squad. Yeah. So the squad versus Trump the and all this and stuff. Ass. And look at all this stuff, all this, ra- and you could be convinced after a YouTube journey that we're on the verge of a race war in this country. But then after that, go outside, 
and go to the fucking store <laughs> and you see people of all different races, mm -hmm. of all different religions, all that. And yeah, it's kind of fine because mm -hmm. like you're trying to buy something and they're buying something and you're going home and no one really cares. That is the market versus the political. Mm -hmm. So that I, I mean, I've seen that point made uh, many times by people at Mises and I think they're more or less right. Amen, brother. Uh, now, also, let's see. Like Marxists, libertarians tend to dwell on what sucks right now and tend to complain quite a lot. Now, I agree with them in many cases, and that's what we've been doing for a little more than an hour here. Yeah. How much the world sucks and the to state sucks. To be fair, it th seems much longer. <laughs> yes. Ah. <laughs> Can I say, though, by the way, and please finish, but this is where I think the, uh, Nick and Reese Magazine are at their strongest. Yes. Is they're the best yes. in the libertarian world Absolutely. at celebrating what's going that's good. That's right. And, and so, what, we're, what yes. we're doing, that's right. Well, yes. I, I love that about them. Yes. I, I think that's the best. Now, Nick, you said something very interesting and exciting to me about 20 minutes ago, which was maybe we should be talking more about creating alternative communities, alternative ways of life. Yeah. Right? I love that idea. Do you have any specific ideas about what to do there? Um, well, you know, this... Because I do. Yeah, okay. I, I, I'm happy to hear what Go yours ahead. are, but it's, uh, you know, this is the... Uh, it's cheesy now, but something like Burning Man, not as a place that you live year-round, but as mm -hmm. a, a demonstration project of just, you know, changing it up every year and, and getting outside of your own head mm -hmm. uh, for a while or, or doing something like... And, you know, and it started as an art project. Mm -hmm. The whole point isn't that you just go there and do a lot of drugs. Um, you know, uh, it's that you go there and do a lot of drugs and then do weird art, you know, or something like that. I think that's models. I was talking to some people who have a commune in upstate New York and like they go up there and they do various things. Uh, you know, that this, you know, any number of things like that. I like, um, you were talking to me the other day about cryptocurrencies that Boom. Yeah, well, why don't you explain yeah, that? So, I mean, this type of thing is, so, uh, you know, there are so many, and this, and, uh, you know, I think Dave was getting at some of this too. There's just so much uh, technological innovation that makes things possible linkages and connections and ways of communicating and finding like-minded people that yeah. didn't exist before. And, and we realized that instead of only having, I'm, I'm a, uh, you'll love this because we're about the same age and you grew up in Berkeley. I'm a big fan of Steppenwolf, the Herman Hess book. It was like a really important novel to me as a kid. And the whole point of the book is that we are all, and it's, it's really bad. I mean, I only read it in translation. It's dull and boring now, but I think it's powerful that we have thousands or infinite numbers of identities within us, which are often at odds with one another. Um, but we should pay attention to all of them and we should develop as many of them as possible. And I feel like we're in a world now, and this is where I, I, I believe in a kind of libertarian intersectionality, the idea that we have multiple different identities, none of them fully define us, they overlap, um, and we should be kind of exploring all of those and seeing what new third and fourth and fifth terms come from hanging out with our friends who we like about this and we like about this and then we see people doing something interesting over there in business or in culture or in commerce and you know we and you just like we're constantly remaking ourselves yep. because we're incomplete we're unfinished we are running out the clock on a life where we have to provide our own meaning yep. i mean I, i'm very much into I, i'm mm. kind of like a libertarian existentialist yeah in that sense i like it and i think that that can provide a, a kind of humane vision that takes libertarianism from being fundamentally, and, and I think it is, it's, it's ultimately a political philosophy, but it, it puts some flesh and some uh, muscles mm -hmm. on this skeleton, and yeah. it will make it more exciting and more appealing to more Yeah, people. I think we need to have physical spaces, I think. So what we're doing at Renegade University, uh, we're trying to establish outposts, we're calling them, across the country and even into other countries as well. Physical spaces where people can work, produce podcasts, can do media, and live for a time, and come and go. Now, we're open borders, right? So there's no, this is not a hippie commune where you're committed to the land and you're gonna be there forever. People can come and go, and it's an, an open, uh, porous system. Uh, that's number one. Works pretty well without a welfare state. Hang on, no. hang on. I got the answer to that too. So here's the problem, right? Uh, all of, a lot of our friends have been shut down from social media, right? And some of our friends have even been shut out of uh, getting, uh, they can't make a, a living because the credit card companies won't allow them to, to use them and PayPal shut them out like our Gavin McInnes and other people like that. Um, so clearly, ultimately, I mean, that's gonna happen to us, I think. At some point, they're gonna come yeah. for us no matter, you know, eventually we're gonna say something that people don't like and we're gonna get shut down unless 
We have a couple of systems in place. We have permaculture, honestly, where we can grow our own food, right? And also, more importantly, cryptocurrency. So once we're in a cryptocurrency world, they can't get us unless they actually move in with tanks and, and expropriate our, our land and our property and our hard drives. Now, cryptocurrency, for those who don't know, and I'm new to this, but I got very, very excited about it, not by talking to a libertarian who's into crypto, but by talking to Daniel Coffeen, who was one of the guests on the show, who's a, basically a socialist of some sort, and he has been working with friends on developing a cryptocurrency coin, a, a, a community, which is a community in which portions of each transaction go to a general fund, which then funds a internal private welfare state that has unemployment insurance, medical care for those who need it, housing for those who need it, you name it. You can do whatever you want with cryptocurrency that is not statist, has nothing to do with the state, it is totally voluntary, and it is autonomous, autonomous. I think that can happen, and that can be a total libertarian thing. You can have your own welfare state if it's private, right? But only through crypto, only through crypto. So I actually think the future is really, really, really bright here. I think there's a huge potential, and I think it's actually inevitable that we're gonna have all sorts of communities. Now, some of these communities, these crypto communities, will basically be communist gulags, no doubt about it, in some way or another, but we can establish our own, and we can even have this thing that libertarians suck about, which is like, well, what do I do when I'm, when I'm out of money and broke, and I, and I have a hospital bill, and they say, well, you know, the market will fix it. In the meantime, there's a whole lot of anxiety for a long time for a lot of us, right? Capitalism is fucking anxious. I've been saying this for a lot of time. Anxious making for, I've been saying this for a lot of time. And that's one of the things that libertarians don't really fully acknowledge, but I actually think there's an answer to it. And that's this. We now have, because of technology, because of the fruits of capitalism and the market, we have the ability to have our own welfare state that is, that is not a state, that can take, take care of ourselves. We can take care of ourselves and other people through that. So it's quite exciting. What do you guys think? I mean, I, that that. Will amazing. you join? And uh, sure, Good. I will. Uh, I will I accept the welfare. I'm not <laughs> sure. I'm gonna, I, I don't know if I'm going to work for it, but I'm ex I'll accept the welfare. Well, I mean, I think that I'm going to test the system, stress test the system. I, I genuinely don't know enough about it to, you know, it, it, see whether or not there's going to be problems in that model. I mean, okay, there'll be problems in any model, but what what the cost versus benefit is, from what I've read about the cryptocurrency stuff. It does strike me that this has enormous potential, like enormous potential. That being said, I don't know. I, I, look, there's a case for optimism. There absolutely is. I also think there's a really strong case for pessimism, and we would be uh, not doing our jobs to not really grapple with that, what that case is, okay? Mm -hmm. Like, understand where we are in this government right now. Like, what's going on? And it's not just that it's like the biggest state ever, so they spend $4 trillion a year, whatever. Understand what's going on. We are the most militarized government that has ever existed. I mean, down to like, not just the, the military industrial complex, I'm talking about the Department of Education having a SWAT team, the EPA having a SWAT team, the 50 plus thousand and SWAT raids that are happening every year. The fact that Obama just very casually signed into law that the government has the right to detain uh, uh, American citizens without trial and hold them indefinitely. Nobody's really taking him up on that. Nobody's really using it too much. Just the Muslims, but you know, not really the rest of us. But now Donald Trump's getting in. The politics are getting more and more. I, I, I know I'm the guy bringing it back to politics, but I do think this is important to focus on. Now we've, we're in this age where you have this crazy democratic socialist left rising up, um, this crazy populist right rising up, and they're just getting more and more crazy. Like, it's, it's really, in real time, we're watching the politics really go to like, holy shit. I mean, if Joe Biden were to run on what Obama ran on in 2008, they're like, you're a Klansman. You know, like, it's, that's, that's how crazy it's gotten right now. And there, this is very, very dangerous. So while we do have more potential to go into these like self-sustaining communities, I hope it all works out, I'm very worried about where this whole thing is is like going and I this think it may could also be the difference between your kid just was born and ours are out of the house right <laughs> you know, that's true you might be right about that are you still you still have your cable news gig are you still on cable news on a regular basis I uh, I had a, a contract with CNN for a while uh, but they didn't resign oh, me Jesus. when that contract uh, uh, did you guys see him was on there, there ever was there a, on the a particular thing that did you have a uh... no it wasn't really I'll be honest I was hoping it would be like a more romantic story like I just fucking smacked down the yeah. thing and then they kicked me off but what happened was more or less that uh, they they moved the show and the time and they just cut all of the contributors and I was a contributor so you didn't on like Pants show. Wolf Blitzer or but, something 
I never had the opportunity yeah, to, okay. but I but I will say what happened to me. I was almost happy when they didn't re-sign me because what they did was I basically had Essie Cup. I was a contributor on her show, mm -hmm. and she her big issue that like her issue is the war in Syria. And, and we it, have it, to fight the war yeah. in Syria because Bashar al-Assad is killing all of these people. So we, obviously, everyone here knows the US military are the good guys who go around the world, you know, saving everybody. So we have to go save all these Syrians from dying. And she's wrong about everything. And she hired me as like, oh, I'm this comedian who will come on <laughs> and Oops. like tell a few jokes right. in between this, these segments. But I know way more than her. Not like I'm um, some smart guy. I just have Scott Horton's phone number so like I know way more than she knows about this shit and I would just we would have these battles and like three or four different times I have these great clips of me and Essie me taking on this CNN anchor number one issue who doesn't know shit about her number one issue and then after we had those like three clips she just stopped letting me talk greatest about war. thing I've ever seen on cable news by far well, everyone google it Dave Smith on SE Cup talking about Syria and a couple other 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 things you you just absolutely laid her out I mean these were I mean these were epic speeches you gave on those panels and I it was really some of the best stuff I've ever seen on even television on in terms of politics oh well thank you yeah, I yeah, appreciate yeah. that and then well thank you but then she just she basically, after that, would just stop letting me talk. Like, they wouldn't have me on for the, the stuff I wanted and to talk about. And that's why you're slumming it here with and, me tonight. Yes. But I still, I do, uh, I, you know, I do Kennedy's show on, uh, on Fox Business all the time. And, yeah. I, and she, Kennedy's the fucking best, by the way. Of Nick's course. on that show a ton. And it's yep. a, she's, she's like, to me, Kennedy is like a hero. Like, she's one of the only people who really, like, she, she has... Uh, voices from all over and every time and even if I know there's a lot of purists out there and this is like a lot of, and I get this from a lot of like ANCAP people too who are like uh, like me but they'll they'll be like oh well she took the wrong position on this or she mm -hmm. took the wrong position on that it's like who else do you know who has a cable news gig who's the host who's lasted this long and made it successful and has had maybe it's not her making the argument but you'll hear the argument on her show that Assad didn't gas his own people that was a false flag which yeah. it was although the last so like yeah. just like yeah. like I promise you that was a false flag yeah Hey, I think it's time to hear from you guys. So what we're going to do is I I'm going to give you this mic because we only have three. So if anyone wants to come up and I want you to come up, I'll give you my mic and you can ask questions of any one of us. So take your time thinking. We can edit out the pause here. You can also go get more drinks if you want to, to loosen up the mind. You want to take a break? I don't like that that was way more popular than asking us questions. <laughs> uh, we want drinks? Fuck yeah. Or we can just go. We're ready to go. Whatever you guys want to do. So come on up. Hey, uh, Dave Smith. <laughs> My name is Alex. Uh, live in Brooklyn. Uh, Dave Smith, Nick Gillespie, say something nice about each other. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> uh, but by the way, that's not hard. As I said many times, I I was a fan of Nick Gillespie before anyone in the libertarian world knew who I was. I was reading Reason Magazine. I think these guys do incredible work. Like Reason Magazine is one of the greatest publications in the universe. In my like, that's very easy for me to say. So anyway, I know you're half joking, but I'm serious. And I'm, I'm trying to remember what Hillary said when <laughs> she was asked to say something like about Donald Trump, and it's like, well, you know, he's closer to death than to birth or something. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I enjoy, uh, Dave uh, does a uh, stand-up gig at all of the Soho forums, which Reason uh, helps sponsor, which are great, and your podcast is great. And I, you know, I like, I like what Dave does very much. Cool. So my question is, uh, my girlfriend and I uh, just signed a lease on a teeny apartment in Brooklyn. Uh, she was homeschooled partly. Uh, I was very conventional, tortured in public school. Uh, we both are at the same kind of education level. Uh, she did great, you know, she, had, she just finished her master's uh, MFA at Columbia. I have a master's. Uh, we're you know, constrained in time and money like everyone else. Uh, and in the non-zero chance that we have a kid, what the fuck do we do you know, limited time and resources about the education thing. I know there's a lot of opportunities, there's a lot of new things, but what do you guys think? I know you have different, slightly different, and that I could add, because since you're a pioneer in this, what should we do? And your son was born when you were at Columbia, or? Uh, uh, my son was born when I was a professor at Barnard College yeah, so. in uh, 2001, yeah. 
I don't know. You guys got the older kids. You answer. What do you do? Uh, well, uh, right now I, I'm well, trying to introduce look at the carrots. Look at what I did, so. and then do the opposite. So, yeah. So what? Yeah. Exactly. So what yeah. I did was I put my kid in a prison for 13 years. Yeah. Now, that wasn't entirely my choice because there was this other person involved in it and the decision making known as my ex-wife, you know, so I couldn't really convince her to, to do anything unusual like that, to take him out of a public school. And I regret it. I hated it every single minute, but I had really had no choice. Also, here's the worst part. He wanted to go to a public school because he thought that's how you got socialized. Right, because that's how, what he learned, and that's that from the culture. So that was a really hard thing to overcome. There's a really good book uh, that uh, just came out called um, Unschooling. Okay, and I, I actually find the unschooling movement really kind of interesting. It, it it kind of came of age in the 70s, 1970s, but it has older roots, and it's it's gone through various kind of uh, revolutions and stuff like that. Um, the one problem with that and it's where you know and this goes to the way you were talking about your nephews I mean like or you know young kids like really want to learn and this book what blew my mind in it was that it had a description of how kids learn how to read and do math without instruction and I'm like that can't possibly be fucking true but it is having said that the problem with that is I do think that's a model that requires having one parent be basically yeah. a full-time attendant to the kids However, there is a network, two networks, large national networks of basically unschooling schools. In fact, we're uh, registered, we're working on uh, with, with the Hudson Valley um, Sudbury School, which is an amazing place, and it's part of a network of schools. There are about 30 or 35 Sudbury schools around the country, and then there's another one called the Liberated Learning Alliance, I think, Learners Alliance, yeah. against a national network of schools. Uh, the Sudbury School is really radical. It is the the, the schools the the, two, the students run the school that is K through 12. There is no segregation among the ages, which is nice too. This is people said I forget who said this, but like it is the craziest thing to segregate these children by age. So you can only yeah. speak to yeah. you can only speak to like the people who are your. Can you imagine if you can only speak to people your age? <laughs> Right. How? What a g great way to retard children's development, right? <laughs> to not allow them to, to speak with adults or to help younger people or anything like that. So if you go to the Sudbury School, you walk in the door, I, I actually wept because it was just pure freedom. And there's some problems there, but this ki the kids run the joint. I mean, they make the rules. They actually do hiring and firing of teachers. <laughs> It's a little much. The only problem I have yeah. with it, the Sudbury model, and I've and I spent a whole day there making an argument to the five-year-olds and six-year-olds and seven-year-olds <laughs> and eight-year-olds. We're like, that no, you're not getting hired. That. That, no, I know. It's like, that that democracy, kids, is puritanical because now have you noticed that when you're actually making decisions in the community forum that you can't play anymore? That it's work, kids. So I I kind of was planting the seeds of anti-democracy, you know, because that's what I do. But nonetheless. Yeah, Nonetheless, the Liberated Learning Schools, as far as I know, I haven't visited one yet, but I think there's none of that democracy bullshit. They just basically let the kids do what they want. And in both schools, so it, the Sudbury School in Hudson Valley, I swear to God, has an entire room devoted to video games. So there's just monitors, and I swear the kids just, if they want to, they can spend all day long playing Black Ops. No kidding, just mm. video games. And there's, there was another room where they were just playing Dungeons and Dragons all day long, led by one of the teachers. You can go, you can go into the, it's, it's next to the woods, it's in the Hudson Valley, you can go into the woods and there's just a boundary that you can't even see. So the kids are actually allowed to go by themselves, five-year-olds, just walk into the woods and be there for as long as they want. This is they built their like own an playground too. It's a Shalomon movie though. I don't know. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah. I, the, the, the one thing that worries me actually about radical school choice mm -hmm, mm -hmm. is so many of the things that I loved growing up like Pink Floyd's The Wall or any number of, you know, like it's all born out of the oppression and the authoritarianism and the boredom of school. Rock and roll wouldn't exist I see. without kind of public schools I see. just creating a dead brain effect among kids. So, so. you want to re you want it's to maintain weird. the oppression of children I mean, so that they can is, be yeah, I, I so that we can cycle. have rock and roll? Is yeah. that it? That's a That's dangerous right. game. Yeah. My it friends. is a dangerous <laughs> um, and, and but then the other thing is that uh, and, and you know there are already more and more choices within the public school system. Uh, there are more and more choices among private schools and things like that. So yeah. Um, and the other, uh, you know, the, the, the other thing I think we, th uh, there, there used to be a, a popular concept in sociology about total institutions uh, that, that are large, you know, it could be the corporation or the prison, the army, the school. And um, uh, Frederick, um, oh God, what's his uh, documentarian who helped create like Cinema Verite and whatnot, he did a, a Wiseman. Wiseman, thank you, Frederick Wiseman did a documentary called High School. 
and it was oh. high school as a total institution, and it's a terrible place. It's like being in the army. You did one called basic training. Great as film. Well. And um, you know, don't think of school as a total institution. So like whatever you're doing for your kid is not gonna determine everything about them. One other thing about unschooling and homeschooling, it's a different landscape now. So 20 years ago, it was basically Christian conservatives like Dave. But now, yeah. but now. Praise Jesus. Yes, but now, uh, no, now there are, there are multiple networks of unschooling uh, and you have lots of parents of all kinds of politics, you know? And I've been interviewing some and some, some will be on my show soon, but yeah, so so you can, you have to be communitarian in a sense, right? Learn something from the left here. Join together, form a network of, of other parents in your neighborhood, and you can do it collectively, right? It's actually doable. See, I always said, because all these asshole libertarians are like, why did you put your son in that prison, Thad, if you don't believe in it? I'm like, dude, give me eight hours a day and a bunch of money, and I will, you know, homeschool him. So no, you can actually do it now through collective effort, right? A, a, outside the state. So it is a possibility, and it, you don't have to be teaching them the Bible either. You can do it with people who actually think like like you. So there really is a bunch of new possibilities, brand new, many of them facilitated by technology, but there's a lot of things you can do with, with children that will keep them out of the state and keep them relatively free. Yeah, I, I, I love all of that. I think, I think that's great. I think there's a lot more, uh, more options that are arising. Um, I know like the, the, the uh, Ron Paul wrote a book about this, has a homeschool curriculum. There's, there's just interesting things out there. I would just say, I would say this, right? Just as, just think about what public schooling really is. And th the best thing I've ever heard in my life was Tom Woods' analogy about, which is just, I, I think this is so fucking brilliant. But he goes, in, say it wasn't the government that ran the schools. Just imagine it was Walmart. Okay, imagine Walmart took all of your kids from K through 12 and they would bring your kids in and the first thing they would have them do is pledge allegiance to Walmart, okay? And then you would look around the room and there were nothing but pictures of all the Walmart CEOs and they would talk about what great people they were and just make up propaganda like the first Walmart CEO never told a lie. Like that's, you know, he got caught chopping down a tree and was like, no, I can't. And just imagine, anyone except the state was doing this to our children. Right. You would look at that and go, this is fucking sick. Yeah. And I would die yeah. before I let my kid go be indoctrinated in this. And uh, just saying, maybe you should think about it that way. I, I want to check but back of, you know, hey. with, with uh, Dave in a couple years when his kid's going to kindergarten. And we're going to see. Yeah. Because the, there is a continue, you know, there's an exigency of this, of like, yeah. you have your ideals and you try to live by your ideals, but it is true that public school Public school is bad. I think, I think school is bad because mm. public school is doing a shitty version of private school for the most part, yes. but it's kind of an oppressive pedagogy. Mm. It's an oppressive mm. relationship, but we'll see. That, kid, that's a fair yeah. point because no. I, I don't, and this is what makes yeah. me almost uncomfortable in saying it, I don't like talking it without walking it, and no yeah. matter what I say here, I can't walk it because my, my kid's seven months old. That being said, over my dead body will my kid be in public school. So when we check back in, I You're promise gonna, you, she's I She's going to be going to Walmart. To the Walmart account. I would rather yeah. that. I would rather just go to the Walmart school. Yeah. At least we would all laugh at it. This is almost yeah. why I prefer monarchy to democracy, because at least everyone knows what's up with monarchy. That's right. You yeah. know, this That's king right. is full of shit. Exactly. In democracy, like, the government is the people, you know. Exactly, so. exactly. By the way, Renegade University will be having high school courses pretty soon. So. Hell yeah. Yeah. Hell yeah. Anyone else? Come on up, Dutch. Hello, Dutch. Uh, nice to meet you guys. Big fan of both of your work. Uh, you keep tacitly endor endorsing Catholicism. We're going to start calling you Trad Russell if you just keep it up. Um, <laughs> but a uh, question for you guys, I guess maybe just more of an observation and like an open-ended thing that you can both talk about. But uh, it seems uh, the tedious nature of the conversation of libertarian versus anarchism that you find boring or tedious. Um, I kind of agree with that sentiment, and I kind of think that anything else is kind of talking shit, which is a lot of fun, which is great fun to do to sit around, get high, and like you know talk about politics and talking about philosophy and things like this, and it's really useful. The best thing is if you get high enough, you don't even need anybody else to be talking to. <laughs> Correct. <So. laughs> but 
when it comes to the politics of libertarian uh, libertarianism versus anarchism, I feel like it's kind of all nestled in um, the tradition of American pragmatism, yeah. um, which you do get into the weeds of 30% taxes versus 10% taxes, which makes you more free. Is there, I think you made the best point, one of the best points of the night, sorry, that one of the best points of the night last night at the SOA Forum, uh, is liberty uh, uh, conducive with uh, politics? which I thought the answer was, no, it's not. Right. Uh, so all of that being said, even if it is just fun talking shit, um, is, what is the importance and is there any value or utility to intellectual vanguards like people like that are anarchists that may not move the needle politically in any sense that they're gonna get Ron Paul elected or not elected? Um, and I know what you guys think of the people that make the difference as far as I want to do drugs, I'm going to do drugs, whether it's legal or not. Um, so outside of the Renegades and Thad's books, uh, how do we look at or how do you guys feel about intellectual vanguards that do this thing that aren't the everyday yeah. common person, but are the people that are spouting off, you know, the Mary Rothbards and even in a more uh, contemporary setting is like a Cody Wilson who, yeah. you know, does something like that. Cool. Uh, no, uh, I'll I'll jump in. I mean, uh, you know, and David talked about uh, uh, Ron Paul, and like, there's no question that Ron Paul in 2008 and 2012 changed the political landscape in a way that we won't fully understand the yeah. impact of that. But by saying things like, "I don't want to run your life, I don't want to run the economy, and I don't want to run the world," because in a free world, you know, you get to run your own life, that's going to pay off down the road. And I think it already is. Um, and it's, it's going to, there's going to be a lot of darkness before all of that. But I believe in the idea, the role of vanguards uh, or of almost sacrificial lambs of, uh, you know, people who do stuff and they are, you know, the, I'm a big fan of Jack Kerouac. Um, you know, and th these are the mad ones, you know, the, the dreamers, the people are, you know, exploding across the, the sky like rockets and spiders and everybody goes, oh, like th those people, intellectual vanguards, cultural vanguards, personal, you know, people who live or walk the walk, um, they make all the difference in the world. Um, and, you know, uh, Thad and I were talking in a, a different conversation about materialist kind of historians versus kind of um, idealist right. ones. And it, it, in the end, you know, material conditions matter, but it's ideas that, that change the world. And it's not, you don't, Archimedes, I guess, needed a lever. Like the lever is a, is a metaphor. I mean, it's, it's about words, it's ideas, and it's, and it's that example that you set. Just real quickly, so Nick just moved from uh, Marxist to Hegelian, just for, yeah. so you know, but anyway. <laughs> so I, the important I, thing is that we stay in Germany. Yeah. <laughs> so I, so you mentioned, right, like Ron Paul, even though he wasn't able to get elected or something, right? And, and th this is like this, this dynamic that I almost think is a false choice that is made a lot between, it's like, well, you know, do you want to just kind of be the, this intellectual thinker who's, who's making these points and making people rethink things, or do you want someone who can get elected? Well, you, you tell me the guy who got elected and actually did anything for liberty, who, Ronald Reagan, uh, he grew the size of government m about as much as anybody, it, it, except for the last two presidents, or last three presidents yeah. in, in American history. Um, Donald Trump, you know, he played to these alt-right guys to, to get elected. Donald Trump's first foreign uh, trip that he went on in his first year of presidency, he dropped, you know, all this like Muslim ban and radical Islam. He dropped off $100 billion in weapons to the most radical Islamists on the face of the planet, the Saudis, and then went and kissed the rings of the Jews in Israel. So what, do, do you need any better like proof that democracy doesn't work than that? And by the way, still waiting on that wall. And I'm not, I don't want the wall. I'm just saying, you're not getting it the people who voted for him to get this wall so it's all like the, this this idea that I actually don't think politics and this is to the point you were making I don't think politics or statism and politics is kind of like the theater to control the power of the state I think this is the antithesis of individual liberty the idea it's like it, it's like trying to turn the mafia 
into a human rights organization. It's never going to work that way. However, if the mafia happened to have a big show every four years where we talk about who the next Don is going to be and someone wanted to get up there and say, hey, does anyone really have the right to be a Don and blah, and could change some people's minds, then that's useful. So I actually think the only thing that's useful is people using the political theater to change people's minds. Because at the end of the day, whether through, it, democracy at the ballot box doesn't do anything. But real democracy, like what you guys were talking about before, what the people actually believe changes everything. So if there's, a, you could have some brutal dictator who, you know, and, and uh, 500,000 people show up on his palace, you know, with torches, and they're like, we demand policy X. And then that dictator goes, you know, I've been thinking about it, and I'm gonna institute policy X. Yeah. That's how change actually ends up happening right. because the people are over it. Yeah. And they, mm -hmm. so, so that to me is like, that's all that matters is changing people's minds. That's all that this thing is all about to me. Yeah. Follow up? Nope, I'm satisfied for that. Um, so democracy, Dave, you're not a fan. No. Yeah, and so I, I know that about you. And guess what? You guys, you weirdos, you anacaps, you've kind of convinced me of this. Nice. The democracy's not so fun. Now, I, um, I, I respect, I, first of all, I like the, the argument that you guys make, which is that it's, you know, the tyranny uh, of the a minority, right? And uh, I like that on itself, in itself, but I don't like democracy for the reason I don't like socialism, because it's just so goddamn much work. Right? I don't want to manage society. I don't want to decide, you know, which streets gotta, are paid. We gotta, get we gotta shut this down and go to the block party and, and vote on everything. Yeah, right? everything. Oh, I mean, yeah. and the more democratic it is, the more decisions we have to make. And well, and you think about the idea, right, like what these democratic socialists propose is that we're going to have the government involved in more and more and more of the economy, but don't worry, everyone will get to vote on it. But how, could, how can you possibly expect the average voter to have the knowledge to, to, to have the expertise to vote on how we run the healthcare system and the financial system and the monetary system and, the, and go down the list of you know everything, the housing industry and all these other things. I mean, it's like, look, this is not how life works. If you're in a car and the car breaks down and like there's four of us in the car and there's me, a New York City Jew who's never owned a car in my life and to, like two other people who don't know anything about cars and one guy's an auto mechanic. We don't go, hey, let's vote on what we should do. We go, you know, so you inform us what is the correct course of action here, and we defer to that person. The and idea then that you we're all say like, uh, I can't really help change the tire because my back hurts. As you go, you oh, oh with, I got a, yeah, I have a know, pinched like nerve, help, but I, you know, and uh, um, yeah. I would love to. I'll be on traffic duty. Uh, now, uh, but the, but yeah. the and and then of course, like to me, the more important principle is the the first one that you mentioned. I mean, I the, the practical yeah. argument that we can't waste all of our time. You can't expect everybody to all waste their time becoming a politician. Mm -hmm and voting on all of these things. But to me, the more important thing is just that nobody has a right to vote on your freedom. Now, like that's, that, it doesn't matter if slavery became popular with 65% of the people or 49% of the people. It's just as evil. Who the fuck cares who someone else votes on? By the way, have you ever met people before? <laughs> a lot of them suck. So who cares what they vote for? Exactly. This, this sort of reminds me of this thing that happened to Radley Balco, who used to write for Reason, you know, who didn't write much about democracy, but I guess he had one little piece written many years ago in which he had a couple of paragraphs in which he sort of just, in a toss-off comment, said something about democracy being not so great. And that was used when he was rising in, in fame because he was writing about, you know, the militarization of the police right. and, all, and criminal justice and the mass incarceration and things that the left should love. Instead of focusing on that, they yeah. simply cherry-picked, they went back and looked on the Reason archives and found Radley saying something about negative about democracy, and that was the reason to dismiss him. Now, was there an argument about, was there an argument made against Radley's position on democracy? No. Ask, ask an American, even an educated American, even a socialist American living in Brooklyn, why democracy is good, and they will have no answer. It is religious thinking, in my view. Yeah. Now, there, there, are, there are arguments for democracy that have been made, but ask an American why democracy is good. You know what I mean? It, it's blank. And it's you not just blank religious to, thinking. Right. It's not just religious thinking. It's not even democracy. It's just the word. Like, they, they don't even associate it with a thing. It's just this kind of, like, good. 
democracy. That's, that's it. So, so uh, like God, Bob. Yes, yeah. Bob Murphy uh, said this on on my show, which I thought this really stuck with me. But he went, you know, I bet you, if Donald Trump came out and said, uh, we're going to have a vote on whether CNN should be shut down and 60% of people voted that CNN should be shut down, they would say, this is a dark day in democracy. <laughs> you know what I mean? But that actually would be completely consistent with democracy if you should just get, could just get a vote to support it. So they, it's not even that they really think about the principle of democracy. It, like you said, it's just this religious mm. like, like uh, dogma that you have to support it. Well, why? Why would you support it if it's democratic? Either you like the policy or you don't like the policy. But who cares what 51% of people think about it? Why would that make the difference? Yeah, yeah. so I think that some people at Reason support democracy, right, Nick? Do you? Do you want to destroy your reputation now, too? <laughs> I, was, I, was, I was taking a little nap, which was helpful. Were you? Good. I'm glad. You're getting older. Now. It's good. But uh, no, I mean, I, I was going to say, uh, you know, I, I moved back to, or I moved, I moved back to New York in September uh, after many years away, and I'd spent all, uh, either part-time or full-time of the past 20 years living in, a, in small town Ohio. Um, and even there, I was going to say, I think you guys are hanging out with too many coastal elites because there's a lot of skepticism about democracy. And I think that most people in America understand, you know, there's certain things that are going to be put up to a vote, but that there are certain inalienable rights or that there are limits to government and that you can't vote away certain types of rights and things like that. And, and that might also just be like the cockeyed optimist to me. But. We have time, I think, for one more question. Uh, quickly, though, uh, I'm going to go all the way in the back. Come on up. Or no, right here. Sorry. This is good. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I wish we had more time, but we don't. OK. Um, so my question is <clears throat> for Dave. And I want you to know where I'm coming from. Uh, like you, Woods, Malice, later on Horton, like brought me from being like somebody who was Googling how to join the Proud Boys to being like <laughs> a fucking anti-war market anarchist. Like this is the problem, this is what, like no one cares enough about what's important kind of thing. By the way, can I just say, and, and I'm very interested yeah. to hear your question, but that really makes me feel good. And no one ever fucking gets that. Right. Because everyone will go, they'll be like, oh my God, Dave had Cantwell on his podcast, or Dave had Richard Spencer on his podcast. And it's like, well, yeah, the reason I have them on my podcast is because I want their fucking audience back on my side. Right. Okay. So, and the, the truth is that, and so I'm glad, and, and I don't know what your question's going to be, but I'm just saying it's like, when, like, uh, it's like, okay, so you you think you're just going to be the left and go, ah, oh, you're evil. And that's just going to draw more people to them because you're not engaging with their ideas at all. So that actually makes me feel very good. And I'm a, I, I like Gavin, but so you know, it's, it's the Proud Boys your, your thing is going to be whether Let's get real. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's just, yeah. I was going to say, is, is, your, is your question like, can you start masturbating again now that you're <laughs> Okay. Hold on, I'll take so, that yeah. once a week. So, but that's <laughs> twice on holiday weeks. So, so I've been getting into a lot more of Thad's work, and and one of the things that that uh, brought me around where I was kind of like playing with the ideas to like really getting into them was actually your piece for Reason, that like forty minute takedown of Jordan Peterson uh, mm -hmm. on postmodernism, yeah. right? And so what, one of the things that I deal with because I am still. Uh, a Christian. I don't really identify as conservative, but I am really fond of the the bourgeois norms and things like that. Mm -hmm. But you know, the 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 work you've done talking to sex workers, and like I will all day like agree with you and with Woods and probably Lou Rockwell, but I don't listen to him as much. But like. Um, on like, yeah, I don't have to say a good thing about it, I just agree that we shouldn't be locking these women up, but at the same time, as long as the majority of people in the room are gonna hear sex work and be like, ugh, they're still gonna be okay with, you know, putting women in cages, or maybe just having the sexist few of women that like, we should just put the Johns in cages, even though that puts them out of work, yeah. and is gonna leave them like, so like, do you think that that's a problem? I'm, I'm like, just bringing it back into that, that question that got really contentious between like you guys, but like, do you, do you see that as a problem for, for the Mises crowd, like, like you were saying before, being so focused on economics and the market and just saying that's gonna take care of everything without deciding to address societal norms and, and what people do in their life outside of like politics, economics, and, and the, the state, the size of the state and the role of the state. So that, that is a very good question, but I, so are you asking what 
I think, like, I just want to be clear on what you're asking. So is it that the, look, to me, the libertarian answer to this stuff, and this is what makes you a libertarian, in essence, is that you go, look, I may feel one way about prostitution, you may feel another way about prostitution. We both have our right to feel that way, but people own their own bodies and can do what they want, and no one should initiate force against them. Right. So let's let the chips fall where they may, and maybe your cultural values will win out, and maybe mine will. And the way we can fight for them is by arguing with each other or making your point, and that's that. But are you asking, look, I think that most of the people at the Mises Institute, not all of them, by the way, but most of them, are what we would consider more socially traditional. Sure. And I gotta say from my own perspective, I hear a lot, a lot of arguments out there, and I've gotten into some spats on Twitter. I know you commented it on one thing, and I was like, I'm not prepared to take on Thad right now on this. But I would look, I literally, I, I'm not. But I have heard a lot of arguments about how empowering and wonderful being a sex worker is. I'm fairly skeptical of this. My mother was a psychologist. I tend to personally err on the side more of believing that a lot of these women who get caught up in the sex work industry are people who were abused as children who are recreating their abuse in a, more, in a dynamic where they take more power. But, you know, that might just be my own personal view. Maybe I'm wrong about that. At the end of the day, to me as a libertarian, it doesn't matter because because I will fight for your right to do whatever you want to with your body as long as you don't aggress against anyone else. And yes, there are way more problems associated with it being a black market. I know for a fact it would be a better situation if it was legal than it okay, is being so, illegal. So, so to make my question like uh, as specific as I can make mm -hmm. it, because I agree with you, um, and I, I, I agree with everything you said, is the way we think getting in our own way to be able to end the carceral state? The what state? The carceral state. Oh, okay. Mass yes. incarceration. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and, and is that a problem that the Mises crowd needs to grapple with and address and come well, around to, to, to Nick and Thad on? I mean, no one's been speaking against mass incarceration more consistently for more years than the Mises crowd. I mean, they've been, I mean, there might be some people <laughs> tied. <laughs> no, no, no but sure. I will. I will grant oh, Ms. I will grant Nick Gillespie a tie, yeah. but I, I wouldn't say more. I'm saying no one more. I'm saying they've both been great on this issue. Look, Ron Paul made this one of his major campaign issues. If you go uh, read uh, Lou Rockwell's book, um, um, against the state in anarcho-capitalist manifesto. The first chapter is about war. The second chapter is about the war on drugs. It was like the most important issue. So I look. I I, I think that. In the same way that libertarians are going to say, well, I stand up for someone's freedom to be in a gay marriage, or I stand up for someone's freedom to be a transgender, or live your life in whatever you're, a sex worker, whatever you want to be, I also stand up for someone's freedom to live in what's considered a more traditional lifestyle, and you have every right to do that. And like, no, I don't think the idea of, ha like, you can walk and chew gum. I don't think the idea that you say, hey, I think there are some societal norms means that if you violate these, you should be thrown in a cage. I, I don't, I, I just don't buy that, I guess. I'll uh, just to add to it, and this, this goes against my earlier uh, discussion of saying ideas really matter. There, there are material realities that matter, and including, you know, s prisons are really expensive. Yeah. Um, and yeah. states are looking to cut money because they're all fucking out of money, and they're, they gotta figure out how they're gonna pay for these pensions that they've been promising for decades that they haven't been saving for and things like that. One of the things that is genuinely great about the current moment, and there's a lot of reasons to be worried about the future, is the carceral state is being uh, both dismantled in many ways. Uh, we are putting fewer people in prison. Uh, we are also changing policies and we're having different discussions about it. And some of this, some of this is based on ideas, some of it is more pragmatic of just like things like, uh, you know, there is a movement afoot to get rid of the uh, cash bail system. And one of the things that has come out about that is just like when people started, the academics started looking at this and it had no effect like making somebody put, post a cash bond had no effect on whether or not they show up for trial and things yeah. like that. And circulating that kind of information is more and more. And we have one of the most comical moments in the 2020 election, and this is gonna be the worst fucking election of our lifetime. It's not the most important, but it is gonna be the worst because <laughs> it's the most recent. But Kamala Harris, who is a terrible carceral state prosecutor mm -hmm. and attorney general for California, is now ha being forced 
to basically shit on her entire record as a prosecutor and pretend that she's in favor of criminal justice reform. Yeah. yeah. Um, I don't want her to be president. I don't want her to win. I don't want anybody to win. I mean, I think it would be well, good. Well, Marianne. Yeah, well, Marianne might <laughs> fucking cuss in you. Very well. Um, but, you know, we're, we're getting into a space now where the thinking on a lot of this stuff is changing. Yeah, um, that's, that's by the way, that, correct. that reason piece on, uh, what was the title? Kamala Harris is a cop who wants yeah. to be president was, was right. incredible. And let me just, the fucking nerve of that woman to go after Biden for not supporting Biden. Yeah mandated busing at a on federal <laughs> level when <laughs> she was an aggressive prosecutor for her to talk about Donald Trump separating parents from their fam uh, kids from their families it's what she did for a living this was her job well, they played hooky. Th th that is real it is really amazing to watch well and she with the busing thing she even a couple days after the debate was like <laughs> oh by agrees. the way I agree with Biden completely <laughs> Um, but, you, but, and then I heard, and then Chris Matthews goes on MSNBC. He goes, but you know, it was never really about the policy. It was about yeah. the emotion and understanding. Yeah. Totally. <laughs> like it's, totally. oh, it's just no. And, and, and you know, this is one of the uh, hopefully 2020. And uh, you know, this is where I'm a really naive optimist. Each of these elections becomes a clarifying moment where people you know, actually start to understand how much bullshit is being spewed. And, you know, we become deconstructionists. We become uh, deconstructionists or postmodernists, and we realize that we need to be more critical readers and consumers of information. Yep. yep. I want to say, uh, I want to say thank you to the best fans ever, the smartest fans ever, for coming out. The first unregistered live. I, I think it was a success. And two of my favorite guys in the whole wide world, Nick Gillespie, Dave Smith, thank you. And we will do this again. We will do this again. Thank you very much.